Uh, hello. Well, this is the official start. It's four and four. And uh, we have an exciting seminar on teaching architecture online. And I'm, I'm a kind of a chairman, but I'm really the link between uh, uh, Alessandro and Karf and my idea to kind of gather all the morphologists online. So, so we had a meeting like two, three weeks ago with the morphologists and then Alessandro had an idea to kind of join everyone together. And we have a very exciting, uh, I would say, a series of presentation from, from architecture to urban design planning uh, to, to, uh, to pure design. Now, Elias will talk about pure design. And, and uh, well, I, I know most of the people here, so, so I'll just, uh, first I will say that uh, Teresa, she could not make it because she went to the hospital. And oh. uh, she just emailed, so, so we will have a, but she said, so she, she said, uh, well, she did not say, wrote anything, but she just said uh, she cannot. So, but we hope she's okay and can, she can join the next seminar uh, with this uh, time. So, so, uh, well, I, I will be very formal as, uh, as uh, Alessandra said, and I'll, I'll start with Carl Croft and make an introduction. And Carl, Carl Krof is, uh, I would say he is the superstar of urban morphology. He just, uh, can I say Carl, that is that a good, uh, uh, he is uh, very much involved with ESUF and he has written a, recently a book of, uh, uh, and uh, uh, about, uh, uh, about urban morphology and application for urban design. So, so he is from, uh, he is a senior lecturer at Oxford Brooks, but, uh, uh, his specialty, I mean, my favorite part of his research is uh, on morphological structure and how different schools, how to kind of uh, converge the knowledge from different schools into one generic kind of uh, urban morphological flow, flow that urban designers can, uh, can use as kind of a background for design. And I have my daughter around me jumping. So, so if you get some strange sounds and... Uh, and uh, uh, you will. Uh, so, so I will just in, in, invite Carl to start, and then wait, I'm gonna... wait a minute. We we have to do some seminar introduction before we do this. So before we introduce the individual lectures, we have the introduction of the seminar and the introduction of yourself. You didn't hmm. listen. Okay. Uh, so welcome everyone, and we decided to organize this seminar because every one of us is struggling. I imagine in different parts of the world on how to do, how to teach architecture online, which is not the same as teaching biology or nuclear physics. There's a different component to it, which is, you know, the drawings, the uh, visual part of the teaching, which is something we are not used to handle online. Uh, and the success of this initiative was amazing. So we're gonna have a second one second seminar entitled teaching architecture online call on something else we're going to find out and we already have six people that are candidates to do their presentation we do apologize for our friends in the world down under in australia and china because the timing of this presentation with the stockholm town time does not allow them to join therefore we're going to have a second one which is going to be based in australia at Curtin University most probably, and it's going to be timed accordingly. But if anyone of you would like to share his own experience in teaching online architecture, and let us know so we can schedule you within the next presentation. Um, maybe not everyone knows that in 1665, the University of Cambridge was closed, was locked down for the Black Plague. And at that time, Isaac Newton, which was a lecturer in that university, uh, continued his work from home, and there he created the formula for the gravitational, gravitational law. So like him, we will continue to learn and to teach and to research. A few words, just one you know, minute for me to introduce the ISUF, International Seminar of, on Urban Forum, which is the International Organization of Urban Forum for Researchers and Practitioners. It was started in 1994, collecting morphologists from around the world. It is organizing conferences and publishing the journal Urban Morphology. The Urban Morphology Journal is a 
for you available on the same website of um sorry you're not seeing my screen i beg your pardon if somebody should have warned me of this you're not seeing my screen okay now you see my screen i'm not going to start again but uh so we are going to uh publish all the materials related to the seminar on the website of the uh, on the website of the laboratory drum that right there so you're going to find the link for the video and uh, further materials over there so the quote here is for isaac newton and in 1616 There you go, 6065, University of Cambridge lockdown. And, and that is the moment and the time when the laws of gravitation were found. So, you know, in this time of difficulties, we're going to continue to learn, teach, and research, just like him. There you go, International Seminar at Urban Forum, urbanforum.org. And this organization is publishing the journal Urban Morphology, which is a science, um, web of science listed journal. Uh, Art and Humanities Citation Index Journal, uh, which is available on the link there below, on the link there below, Journal Online. The same organization is organizing every year an international conference, and this year it will take place, I mean, virtually take place in Salt Lake City, Utah. It will be a virtual conference, uh, and next year it will be hopefully physically in, um, in Scotland, in Glasgow. Now, who is Todor Stoyanovsky? I would like to introduce him. He's an architect and a PhD, holds a PhD in urban regional studies. He is currently a postdoc at um, uh, e ESAL, Embodied Social Agents Lab, and CST, Division of Computational Science and Technology at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And we are now, everyone is in Stockholm, following the Stockholm time. We are, he is kindly in um, KTH, Royal Institute of Technology, kindly hosting all this conference on the Zoom platform they hold there. He is researching on urban forms, sustainable mobility, and digitizing urban design practices. Uh, he is uh, researching about urban morphology, urban space, environmental psychology, transit-oriented development, traffic planning, information technology, and urbanism, geographic, GIS, building information uh, modeling, and gaming. So now I can hand it over to Todor. Oh, thank you. Well, it was a nice introduction. Sorry for me still starting this very, uh, I mean, rushing. I always rush. I'm not very formal. I just like to talk and... Uh, Yes, Shame on I, you. Shame on you. I know. And then Alexander is always uh, kind of putting me to place. So, so well, one more time introduction to Carl Croft. So, as uh, I, I, I was uh, li li reading their, their chit chats on, uh, they had an ESUF, I think they have an ESUF mailing list. And, uh, and, and then I thought, like, well, we can, and, uh, and I was talking with Ivor Samuels and Paul Sanders. We were writing a, paper, a piece on uh, digitizing urban design practice. And we, we have like an online gathering of, of morphologists. And when Alessandro saw this, he said, we're going to need to organize this big seminar. And, and Karl Kropf, uh, he, 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 he is really the, also, uh, Alessandro is the engine, but Karl Kropf is the big support behind this. And, uh, and as I said, yeah, I, I would uh, I would rank him as a superstar. I mean, in in urban morphology research and writing these lovely books, and promoting urban morphology in urban design. I said, uh, senior lecturer at Oxford Brookes University, fantastic work on morphological structure and trying to combine all this cool and different experience. And uh, and uh, should I say anything else, Carl, or you just start your presentation? Lovely having you here.
on mute. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Toto, a very um, yeah, full introduction. And thank you, Alessandro, um, for your introduction and really both of you for organizing everything. Um, I, yeah, what I have to say is really, really um, kind of pragmatic, practical and quick. And so I hope it's of some use. And I, I suspect that as we've all been kind of confronted with these issues over the last few weeks, that some of what I have to say, you'll probably go, oh, well, I've worked that out now because I've had to. Um, so I, you know, it's, I'm anticipating that a lot of you will um, kind of see this as pre being fairly um, straightforward. Um, but I wanted to give it a bit of structure. Um, so I've got um, a, a few slides. And then what I was going to do is just put up some student work and scribble, basically, just, just to demonstrate so if you don't already know. So um, the what I, so I want to talk about the tools um, within Zoom and then talk about using them both for individual tutorials and then group workshops and tutorials because they, they work quite differently. Um, and just to say that this is really a joint effort on the part of everyone um, at Oxford Brooks um, working in the urban design um, program. So that includes the, the head of the program, Rahina Lim, John Cooper, um, Laura Nova de Azevedo, Alan Reeve, and myself, um, the, the team. And Rahina and John have been quite uh, instrumental in putting together some of the, the ways that we've been doing things. Um, so to say this isn't rocket science, you'll have started to work it out. But um, the key tools that we found that are useful are the record, so what we're doing now, so that there's a record of, of it. And if you kind of nose around in the, the um, settings, you should be able to find that you can, um, if you initiate the, the Zoom session, you can set it to automatically record. So you just let it do it and you can either record it to the cloud or locally. Um, the mute, I think everyone's now kind of got the, the etiquette of Zoom, which is if you're not speaking, put your mute on. So your children don't interrupt, or the dog or the cat. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. The chat um, is quite useful. Um, and one of the things we do, as I'll say later, is that some, particularly in groups, it's good to have two tutors so that one tutor can monitor the chat. So students can ask questions on the chat and then the the other tutor is, is say, working with some of the, um, the other, the, the work that's being um, looked at specifically. The share screen, obviously, we're just doing it and the annotate tools, which I'll um, look at a bit. But I think that those things are fairly, should be fairly straightforward. Um, but what we found is quite important is how we organize the sessions. And so this kind of goes through the process that we do for individual tutorials. So essentially we have the design project. So there'll, there'll be a brief that's in the module handbook. Um, so they know what to do. Um, obviously in this case, we've started um, on site and have then had to do the, the, the tutorial work um, at a distance. Um, obviously we need to start looking at how specifically we might run a session to, uh, you know, to introduce the, the design project. So they have a brief. Then when it comes to, so they'll have done some work and what we do is to timetable 30 minute tutorial sessions for each student. So that's something we as the tutors do and say, this is when you've got to be around. And so there, we've set up a spreadsheet. We use Moodle. Um, for all the main communications about the module. Um, and so each one, each one of them has a slot. But what we then do is say the student 
has to have their own Zoom account and they're the ones who set up the invitation. So they invite us to their session. That allows them to record it and it also gives them the responsibility to sort it out. Um, and they, you know, if some is as the case, sometimes they don't show up, that's their thing. Um, ideally, we like them to let us know so we're not sitting around waiting and waiting for them. But if we don't get the invitation far enough in advance, then we do something else. So that's up to them. So it's important. I mean, bearing in mind, these are postgrad students. So this is a, the MA in urban design. Um, <clears throat> so the student then records the session. Um, they share their screen of the work that they've done, and we discuss and annotate the work. So um, what I'll do is stop sharing this screen um, unless I can do that. Well, let me know, has that changed the screen at all? Or do I need to share, stop the share and start again? I'm gonna share another screen. You have to stop sharing and start over. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's a, a, this, now this is an undergrad student's work, but none, nonetheless, so the, I mean, if you haven't already started using them, there are a, a, a number of annotation tools. So you go up to the top, hit um, the, um, the, 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 the this, um, the menu bar should come down and you use annotations and there's a bar. I tend to use the draw. So when the student has put that up, is explain, they then explain it and then we can say, well, okay, you know, I can then use that tool just with my mouse to say, well, does that, those, do those plots actually work? Um, and then, or say, okay, then I can change the color and say, well, is there going to be any buffer here? So I can start you know, doing lots of annotations. So there's the, the, the draw tool, then there are um, arrows. So then I can say, well, okay, are there vistas um, coming down? And so there are a number of things that we can do. And so we use those back and forth. So they can then draw as well. Um, and, you know, as I say, it's, it's not, rocket science, um, but those are the, the, the two main tools, the, the draw tools that are useful. And then, you know, you can get different width, widths as well. So you can, you know, it's relatively flexible, but the main thing is that you're interacting with the student and doing, you know, in a sense, we can do what we do on the table. So I would be sketching. Now, another thing that would be ideal which I haven't done yet, which probably we'll do shortly, is to get a tablet. So just a Wacom tablet, and then you can draw um, more easily than with a mouse. Um, so that, that, you know, as I say, it's all fairly straightforward. Um, once you, the thing is with the, the Zoom annotations is they're on the, the, the screen on top of it. So if I zoom out, um, the annotations stay the same. So you can't, you know, you you then you cannot, there's a clear button or you can just control Z to, to go backwards and get rid of them. Um, so once you've done it one or two times, it should become fairly easy. There is an eraser, it actually is quite slow um, and a clear button. So the thing you can do is once you have a Zoom account, you can start one, start your own meeting and just test it out. So put a drawing up and see how you scribble and see how you, how you get used to it. So as I say, it's not, not rocket science, um, and, um, but is fairly straightforward. Um, so um, the other thing that we have been doing, um, and this is it's quite interesting is because Zoom has allowed this to happen more easily. Normally, we try to get to a, a, um, a the tutorial session someone from pro professional practice, either a someone from an urban design office or someone from a local authority, a planner, um, urban designer, 
um, who's on the, the regulatory side. Um, that can be difficult because if they're coming in, they have to travel in and they spend a day and they don't always have the time to do that. So what we do is the same process of setting out a very clear timetable. You say you would assign the student a mentor and they get one of each. And we, you know, obviously we've kind of talked to the mentors in advance and said, are you willing to do this? Yes. How much time do you have? So maybe they have a three half hour session. So an hour and a half of their time in a week. Um, if, you know, it's for example. So again, we timetable the 30 minute tutorial sessions. Again, it's up to the student to get that invitation and they go through the same process. And the thing that I've found, this is kind of anecdotally is the students are much more focused in this context than they often can be when we're in a studio. So in the studio, there's lots of noise going on, there are other people hanging around and it can be quite distracting. Whereas up till now, the students have been very focused and attentive and grateful for the, for the, the, um, the interaction. Now that could be the context, which is they haven't got much interaction. Um, but anyway, so they will get at least one tutorial from us or two. They get one from a planner and one from a designer. Um, then again, so that they, they do this, the same process. Um, then, so that's for, for individuals. Um, and the other thing is we just say, well, if you want another session, just let us know. Um, so we you know, voluntarily say, that's something you can do now for the the for group work um and we we you know though a number of people in the university don't like us doing group work for various reasons it's not very understandable but anyway we give them a, a group task as well as individual design um work so they do I mean, we do this because urban design is interdisciplinary and you need to know how to work in a group. And so we get them to do work in a group. Um, so we assign the workshop task. Then what we've done is to issue the, the instructions for the, the workshop um, with a Zoom lecture. So I will set up a, a, a Zoom session of one, um, record myself with the, the presentation, um, and they then give that to them as a as a video. Um, and in this one case, we had someone else, an outside person with expertise in Hong Kong, talk about the Hong Kong shop house and its development. Um, so they did a morphological analysis of Hong Kong, or a bit of it. Um, so we issue that. They go off and they, we assign the groups. They have the, the specific groups. Now, what interesting is just what's emerged is, and this is what we learned from them, is that we asked them, how did you, you know, how did you do it? Well, they would um, coordinate a group session themselves. Often, most of them are on WhatsApp, and so we have a, a WhatsApp group for the whole of the, 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 the year, um, but they arrange that. They have that group session, so they are uploading drawings talking through it, they go then and undertake separate tasks, share those on a G drive, and then have a coordinating, coordinating session um, to put it all together and to, to finish off the design. Then when we have a feedback session, <clears throat> a tutor sets that one up. And so we say, here's at this time, we assign them a time to, to present, we record the session, um then the group shares its screen um and then the tutors again are using annotate to point out issues and we had in this case we had the three of us so there were rahina and i and roland wong who's from from hong kong um is you know providing input so we have the groups who share their screen we discuss and annotate um as i say you know, those not speaking use mute, like we're all doing now. Um, we have questions, and one of us will monitor the questions and throw that back out. Um, 
and then the ideally um, one two will lead the discussion but we generally have a a, a, a a group discussion and you know i've i you know in terms of the experience of doing it i found that um it's still been very positive the students are again attentive and want to get the want the input um and they i don't think find it difficult um and you know are comfortable doing it so that's what i have to say so i hope it's of some use um as i say very practical i'm hoping that a lot of you already know it but it may be just helpful to have it reinforced so happy to answer any questions if anyone has any well uh thank you thank you carl anyone has questions uh want to say something they can write on the chat and yeah, we'll no, no one really yeah there, there is a possibility to write questions on the chat uh, and uh um but uh yes anyone spontaneous question Hold on, let's I take have a the question. discussion oh. at the end not well, now let's so take all one, the discussion one quick at the question end. will be good yeah uh, then let's they... go to the next one oh, well i i just have a question because i participated in a re urban design review session yesterday um and is there a way for the visiting critics to also uh, draw on the drawings <laughs> on, on the PowerPoint presentation that the yeah, any, anyone can, anyone should be able to draw on it. Okay. So any, you know, I don't, I, I haven't looked at the details of whether you need permission to, you know, to give permission, but certainly when we had the session with the three of us, we all three of us had, were able to, to mark on the drawing okay sorry i should kind of remind you that uh we're gonna take the questions in the chat box and i'm gonna collect those questions and ask in the end of the seminar so if that's possible from now on uh, if you could write your questions in the chat uh to share it with everyone and i'll uh, take count of them well it, it's always good to have one, uh, always good to have one question but let's go to the next presentation so the next presentation is the university of ferrara department of architecture and i think it's uh uh i think it's uh luca who will present isn't it not uh uh not uh, marcelo yes 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 marcelo is uh in another meeting now at the same time so he's moderating this meeting i think he will listen our discussion probably but at the moment is not able to take part uh, probably later well, uh, well, I, I will just uh, say uh, because we, we met like few days ago, and Lu Luca works uh, with with digitalization ar of architecture, and kind of using different digital tools to kind of uh, uh, support uh, uh, support the the teaching process. Yes, uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. So, so you can. Uh, 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 do, is there? And I, I don't have here the whole biography, but you you are you are. Professor at the uh, University of Ferrara and Yes, if you want I can say something during yes. the, uh, the I apologize. Of the sorry. Just... I'm going to make the presentation. No. I, I'm sorry. Okay. One second. It's coming uh, There you go. So Luca Rosato is a research fellow at the Department of Architecture of University of Ferrara Wait, I can even share my screen. That's incredible Sorry for this, you know this complication here Okay, I'm going to share my screen and show him. There you go. Okay, Luca Rosato is, so, so this presentation has two names. One is Professor Marcello Barzani, who is a professor at the Department of Architecture at the University of Ferrara. And the presenter is Luca Rosato, who is a research fellow at the Department of Architecture at the University of Ferrara. Um, architect and uh, researcher in the field ECAT 17, which in Italian means uh, survey, um, at the Department of Architecture of University of Ferrara. Uh, his areas of investigation are both the vernacular and modern architecture documentation, representation, and enhancement. In these fields, he was coordinator project for the DAPREM Center activities in India and in Brazil contract professor at the University 
of Ferrara. He was visiting professor at the Pontificia Università de Católica do Paraná, Brazil, uh, at CEPT University, Ahmedabad, India, and McKenzie University in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and also at the Burgundy School of Business in Dijon, in France. He's been member of the editorial staff of Paisaggio Urbano, an author and co-author of more than 130 publications. He is a member of ECOMOS and of the Italian Union of Drawing. So please apologize for us for the this guidance and the you know not putting your picture in the booklet. We might have the time to do that um, later. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro, for the introduction. No problem uh, at all for me. I keep the time, so okay. Uh, I share okay, my I screen. It. Can you see the slides? Yes, can you see them? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, so today I'm going to present our approach in teaching architecture inside uh, a point cloud. Um, I work uh, for the Apron Center, which is developing uh, uh, 3D geometric survey modeling and representation technique uh, since uh, 1997. I joined the group in 2008. My expertises are uh, the digital uh, documentation of vernacular and modernist architecture with a specific uh, focus on the South American architecture and uh, Asia uh, vernacular heritage. Um, um, <clears throat> I teach at the university with Marcello, uh, Professor Marcello Balzani. Uh, our uh, course is called Architectural Documentation. Um, it's part of the second semester of the first year of a master degree in architecture, five years long. Uh, so we deal with a very uh, young uh, students at the first year of their uh, university path. Um, the teaching objectives for us are uh, always the acquisition of theoretical and procedural aspects related to the documentation, uh, specifically uh, direct survey and uh, architectural representation. So the activity is mainly organized, uh, split in two uh, modules, architectural survey module, uh, by, uh, taught by Marcello Balzani, and representation techniques module, for the which I am in the professor in, in charge. Um, beside the uh, traditional um, learning of uh, teaching of uh, um, survey and documentation, we, uh, since this year, we uh, planned uh, DOC, Drops of Knowledge. They are meeting with professionals and colleagues in order to um, give to the students some stimulus about the virtual tour, um, photos of architectures, archaeological survey by drone, um, again, color documentation, survey of vernacular buildings, and uh, uh, information about the uh, current process from point cloud to uh, BIM. Um, I have prepared this uh, diagram to explain our methodology in these difficult times. Um, you can read it um, vertically. I have divided it in four areas. The first one from the left. Uh, uh, describes the main challenges uh, and then the mitigation that we faced, the mitigation activities that we planned, uh, and then the learning verification process uh, that we started to uh, check the um, learning level of the students from this online um, teaching activity, and then the main result of our um, work with the, the students. I'm going to um, go through the uh, diagram uh, horizontally by, by rows, um, starting with the most obvious. So we are uh, actually uh, recording lessons and video tutorials for the students. We use the OBS Studio software, an open source project, and we upload the, the uh, contents on the Google Dive uh, platform of the, of the course. We check this process by uh, Google Forms that we send to the students in order to understand uh, if they can answer some uh, questions and if they are uh, correctly understanding and uh, learning our uh, instructions. Um, the feedback of this was quite good because the students actually are benefiting from the e-learning as um, it uh, 
uh, can provide opportunity uh, for them to work at their own uh, pace. Also for students with the learning uh, difficulties, um, this methodology is working uh, quite, uh, um, quite well. Um, I show you just a few uh, inputs about this, the interface of uh, the OBS Studio software. It's open, it's also, also the students can download it and send us uh, videos uh, related to their uh, difficulties in uh, approaching uh, the methodology of direct survey and uh, also the uh, software that we use. Uh, the streaming uh, lessons are recorded and, uh, and then uploaded also on the, on the platform. And this is the Google Drive of the uh, course where there is a section of videos and slides in PDF and also uh, a folder for each student where they can uh, store the exercise we ask and then uh, we can uh, access the folder and check the quality of the, uh, the production of the students. This is one of the uh, form that we send to them to um, also check the learning uh, level for each uh, um, student. Um, Following the second row, the uh, challenge is that students cannot access the computer lab of the department. This could be um, quite uh, uh, tough for a course like uh, this one where when we um, use a big uh, um, database uh, um, recorded in, um, with a 3D laser scanner, acquired by laser scanner. Uh, so you, in the last uh, um, year, we uh, had the chance to have uh, the software cyclone on uh, the computer lab. So the students have access to the, uh, this expensive, actually, uh, software in, uh, thanks to the, uh, the computer facilities lab. Um, this year, we uh, decided to uh, switch for an open source, again, software, Cloud Compare, um, which works quite well for um, the managing of uh, uh, 3D uh, point clouds. Uh, at the same time, we use uh, AutoCAD 2020 uh, with uh, the students' completely free um, license, the um, uh, academic license. Um, this uh, um, brought us to uh, give uh, some exercises to the uh, students. Uh, from uh, these exercises, they can um, learn uh, step by step. And these exercises are also evaluated by, by us and the evaluation is part of the final, the final mark. In terms of outputs, I can say that the students are actually uh, using uh, these uh, the new skills to manage a point cloud, which is, in my opinion, um, a good uh, achievement for a very young uh, student, 19 years old uh, student of architecture, and they are elaborating CAD drawing uh, from these um, images uh, saved from the point uh, uh, cloud uh, software, cloud, uh, cloud compare. Um, again, some images of the process. So this is the interface of cloud uh, compare with uh, some video tutorial that we offer to the students. Uh, again, AutoCAD video tutorial. The exercises that are then evaluated by, by us with some uh, criteria and the final uh, mark between zero and five. I go quickly to the third um, road. The uh, problem is that the students cannot leave their own house. As you are aware, uh, they are still at home. Uh, so for a course like this one, where they should learn how to direct survey a building and architecture, uh, this uh, uh, was the main, uh, the main challenge. So as a mitigation activities, we planned in one hand to um, ask the students to produce some documentation material from their own uh, houses. So actually they are sketching, they are measuring their houses, um, they are taking uh, pictures, uh, graphic elaboration, um, and they are learning by doing how to document, how to survey uh, an architectural space, a simple architectural space, because they obviously live in average uh, houses. 
uh, average quality houses, not in very uh, old and important buildings. But this is the base to understand the methodology. Then through the uh, point cloud we provided them, they are uh, completely uh, inside a um, very um, important architectural context, which uh, is part of our database. Uh, as a DiaPrem Center, we have many uh, 3D databases on architectural complexes. So every year, <clears throat> since last year, we started to uh, select some uh, complexes and divided in small point cloud. We uh, give the students this uh, portion and they are completely inside this uh, 3D environment uh, studying uh, the finest architectural features. Um, the uh, verification process in this case uh, is based on hand drawing, digital elaboration, and point cloud outputs that we can evaluate and the student can upload on the uh, cloud <coughs> of, this, of the uh, course. And again, these materials are based on the houses of the students and on historic places we we selected. Um, uh, again, we are quite happy about the result because uh, uh, the student use the house as a place for understanding uh, methodology and uh, survey uh, processes. Uh, and then they have to apply it on a point cloud, uh, theoretically, obviously, um, on a point cloud environment of historic uh, data. You can see here the preliminary sketches of uh, the students' houses. Again, they have the st to study the morphology and then they start to uh, measure the, uh, the space and also the architectural uh, features. As you can see, we are talking about very simple um, places, um, but at the same time, they are uh, involved in the architectural survey of more important uh, architectures, thanks to the uh, point uh, um, cloud navigation. These are some elaboration from <coughs> the students' uh, um, work. So actually they understand how to cut a section horizontally and vertically, how to um, study uh, a floor uh, detail or uh, ceiling decoration. Uh, etc. At the same time, uh, they are applying uh, the extra content that we offer them, as uh, I told you, uh, the doc uh, meeting, uh, now online meeting, unfortunately, not uh, in the classroom anymore. Uh, so, for example, they are surveying colors of their houses with the methodology we uh, suggested them. Uh, they are realizing virtual tour uh, through the houses and they upload it on the, uh, this platform, the thesis platform, which works quite quite well, a platform where uh, we can uh, check the work and upgrade also, let them upgrade the work with the more material, for example, PDF plan of the same houses with link to the 360 um, pictures that are taken with Google Street and um, up by the mobile. Um, I have just three minutes, so I focus my attention, your attention to the four, fourth row. Uh, the students uh, uh, need a weekly discussion with the professor. For us, in this kind of uh, courses, uh, this is uh, the most uh, tricky um, uh, lack. Uh, actually, we are facing, uh, uh, we miss a lot the uh, discussion with the students, so we try to mitigate this uh, through the Google Meet discussion in order to have the chance to share the screen and the students also are sharing the screen and the drawings for a single tutorial. Um, during the review, we ask also the PDF file and we send the PDF back to the students with some annotation for let them understand the uh, major uh, mistakes. Um, as a main result, this weekly uh, review process that will last until the end of the semester, uh, is going to give them uh, inputs on representation solution survey um, methodology that are also uh, recorded at the end of each uh, tutorial session and put online in the um, Google Drive of the course. You can see here uh, the streaming of uh, tutorial of 
a group of three students on uh, AutoCAD issues. Uh, some general issues are faced with uh, the streaming of general uh, tutorial with all the students, the 70 uh, students of the, uh, of the course. Uh, this is the drawing uh, checking PDF file where we can put note on the uh, program we identified on the, the drawing. And then to conclude, I want to show you some outputs that are from the last year, uh, but I hope to have the same quality uh, this year as well. So actually you see they work on the point cloud and then they uh, redraw the uh, building, trying to act um, as uh, um, they were there. So the, the question is uh, if the students have had the chance uh, to survey the place, uh, how they would have measured it. Uh, the answer is that they are involved in the uh, deep in the, in the environment and they are uh, representing the methodology they would have used in on uh, place if they have had the chance to be on place. Again, transliteration of a uh, uh, staircase. Uh, again, they have to select the methodology and represent the, uh, the space. So at the same time, it's a representation issue and also a methodological approach for the direct survey of the space. <clears throat> you see again here some uh, section, um, AutoCAD section from the point cloud elaboration. Here they um, are trying to identify the level, for example, of the survey by the which uh, they can uh, identify the dimensions of each uh, architectural uh, feature. Again, some uh, overlapping. Remind you that your time is almost over. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm the last uh, uh, slide. So actually I'm finished. These are some details they are elaborating and uh, some tridimensional views they are working uh, on. That's it, many thanks for your attention. Sorry for this extra minute I have taken. And uh, if Thank you have you. any questions, you can, uh, you can yes. write. Well, 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 well we, we prepare. Maybe if someone has a quick question, we can. Uh, uh, sure. We can. Anyone? No? Okay, then we go to very quick with Lamberto. I, I'm uh, going to be very official and uh, read. Lamberto is an associate professor in architectural urban design at the Department of Architecture in the University of Bologna. And, uh, and uh, he, he's uh, uh, devoted uh, to research and project concerning architecture in the city. And uh, he's a co-director of the series Seca, or Theory of the Com Architectural Composition. And, uh, and, he, uh, and, and he, he is uh, very much focused on the work on John Hayduk and Aldo Rossi. And he's author of numerical publication, including uh, lots of book in, in, in Italian. I, I, uh, maybe, uh, and, uh, and uh, well, I, I, I uh, there, uh, uh, Lamberto, can you help me? There more uh, continuation of Aldo Rossi tradition, yes? Lamberto? Uh, I, didn't op I didn't open the microphone, okay. Ah, uh, sorry. No. Yes, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, your, your, the floor is yours, so you can open your presentation and start. Uh... Yeah, okay. I share the screen. Yes. Okay, you can see my, my screen, yeah? Yes, works okay. great. I want to present uh, this uh, a European Commission uh, Erasmus Plus uh, Strategic Partnership for higher, uh, higher Education Program that I coordinate. The, the title of my intervention is Archea, a blended circular teaching learning program. Uh, Archea, so it is a, a bit different because this program is not just not only virtual, but it mixes uh, 
mo uh, physical and virtual mobility. Arkea is an acronym. Uh, it is. Uh, it means uh, architectural European medium-sized city arrangement, and uh, involves a partnership of five universities, all the universities located in medium-sized medium-sized uh, European cities: Cesena, Bolo, Cesena, Parma, Gliwice in Poland, Aachen in uh, German, Rouen in Normandy. The focus of the program is the open space of the city, but uh, today we will speak, I will speak about the focus of, the, of this webinar, teaching architecture online tools and strategies. Uh, actually, uh, apart this time of coronavirus, uh, the Arkea project was born from a 2017 European agenda uh, which already gives some indication, indications regarding the introduction of innovative elements in higher education. It is uh, the renew European Union agenda for higher education. Innovation concerns both the structure of the program and uh, the introduction of some technological tools. But all of, the, all of this in the specific field of architecture teaching, learning, and especially in the field of urban design. Uh, the structure of the program. The structure of the program starts from uh, the very specific nature of the discipline, which already contains a theoretical component and a praxis related to the technique. Architecture is the combination of arche and techne. Techne intended both as a know-how and a technological praxis. So the program is uh, uh, like double, it's blended because it mixes uh, uh, mobil uh, virtual mobility and physical mobility, and then it, it mixes uh, theory and praxis, uh, arche und, and uh, techne. Uh, it's a sort of di dialectical position, and uh, we uh, tried to show this uh, dialectical position in the structure of the program too. Uh, on the one side, the world of theory, and then the other side, the world of practice, and the one side, science, art, thought and form, urban study theory, and architectural design workshops, experimental workshop about a specific city, about a specific study area. Uh, so this uh, dichotomy is more specific. Uh, on the one side is the urban theory and on the other architectural design workshop. Uh, the architectural design workshop assumes the form of intensive program for learners and uh, uh, it means upon a real specific architectural workshop with a real physical mobility and the other side is the urban study theory is it is five e-learning path open educational resources and mooc you know mooc is massive uh, massive open online courses. The, uh, the practical part is uh, concentrated about the study of uh, two cities, specifically Bologna and Aachen. The theoretical part is online. This part is, uh, 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 is a program that follows other indication of many documents of the European Union. The European Union insists a lot uh, on the distance learning, not just for the problem of the coronavirus, but uh, for the, to respond to problems such as uh, the life, lifelong learning 
and the open education and the social inclu in inclu inclusiveness. The, the practical part of this blended program concerns the two international architectural design workshops. In this case, the Erasmus Plus program uh, supports the physical mobility. Actually, uh, 30 students and 10 teachers from four countries took part in the architectural design workshop uh, on a real study area in Bologna organized in Cesena by me and, my, and, and, and uh, by my school and was Alessandro present uh, as uh, visiting critics. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, regardless of the outbreak of uh, this pan pandemia, the program already envisaged experimenting with remote design practices during the face-to-face -face architecture workshop. Uh, actually, uh, uh, through, through the use of a graphic tablet and a digital pen, such as the uh, we use this, this model of uh, Wacom, 32-inch uh, uh, Wacom, and of course a screen uh, sharing platform software, not Zoom, but Teams. But the, the concept is the same of uh, the Professor Klopp of before. Uh, so with the Teams and this, uh, and this uh, electronic table, we were able to discuss graphically with a teacher located in another city. So we had a discussion uh, between students in the, during the architectural workshop and a teacher located in another city, in another university. After the, the lockdown, after the coronavirus, we used this practice, of course, uh, normally for our, for our, de for our uh, design workshop uh, of the University of, Ar of Architecture in Cesena. So it, it, it's a sort of case. Uh, I want to explain why in my title I, I have uh, written circular, blended circular teaching learning program. Uh, uh, the cycle is uh, uh, one that is established between theory and design and in which it is difficult to say which one comes first. It's like a circle. Or later, the theory comes first, but then the architectural design reacts ret retroactively to the theory. So it's like a cycle. And redrawing in the, in the middle of the, the cycle, we did redrawing of, of the city of Bologna and of the city of Aachen. Redrawing play a fundamental role in this circle. circle. It is a sort of medium term. Le Corbusier called it language of description. So we had a sort of language of description between, in the middle, between the theory online and the practical activity during the architectural design workshop. Uh, so the, 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 the experimentation, the practice, the praxis uh, react to the theory and the theory is changing. Uh, so the, 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 this circular teaching path is theory, redrawing of Bologna in our case, and a specific design, a specific study area of Bologna. The, the Arkea program for this two cycles, one about the city of Bologna and the same, the same cycle, the same, the same path with, of course, other students, with, of course, other teachers uh, in, the in, in, in the next year, in this year, in November of this year, about the city of Aachen. So the two cities are Bologna and Aachen. I want to say 
something uh, just uh, about uh, the topic uh, of the program. The topic if this is the city, is the European medium-sized city, but specifically is the, the open space of the European medium-sized city. Uh, the idea, the main, the main idea is that, that the open space of the European Sun city is recognized as a psychological, sociological and aesthetic high quality space. Uh, for this reason, it can be assumed as a resource to conserve and develop. So uh, the question is, uh, we don't uh, we didn't uh, didn't assume abstract models of open space quality evaluation but we assume concrete models and so uh, the redrawing is a way to study this specific concrete model of high quality open space of the city of course it, it is a formal, syncretic, reductionistic approach. It's not a complex approach, maybe, but reductionistic, formal approach. Uh, the program foresees five intellectual outputs, so the redrawing. I have spoken about this redrawing of the open space. Uh, the redrawing are made by all the partners with the same frame, with the same uh, scale, at the same scale. So it is very useful to confront, to compare different approach because this partnership is not really, uh, is, is just very different uh, approach. It's not uh, a fa family partnership, but right? it is a partnership composed by very different uh, approach. Uh, so the second one, the second one is uh, uh, intellectual output is the MOOC, and then we have nine transnational project meeting in all the cities. We have seven multiplier event. We did just we did uh, four of 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 them in Aachen, in Gliwice, in Poland, in French. One short term term joint staff training. It was really useful because it, uh, uh, now we can use uh, the platform Zoom, we can use, uh, we can use uh, Teams, uh, and uh, we, 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 we start to be used. But at the beginning, we, we knew absolutely nothing. And so this short-term joint staff training is an activity of the, of the program. Uh, to, uh, exp to, to, to teach to the staff how to use digital tools and sharing, uh, screen sharing, uh, screen sharing platform and so And though we have two intensive programs for higher education, the two architectural design workshop, workshop. And then if we can, if we have more time, I don't know how many time. Three minutes left. Two minutes? Yeah. Three. You still have three minutes. Okay. One, two, three. I want to, to show just the, the, a bit briefly the, the website. I have to stop the share and, and, and then again, yeah? Maybe. Aurora. Yeah. Okay, and now sharing. Okay, do you see? Do you see my screen or not? No, not no. now. No, no. Okay, share, share, share. Okay, we can see now. Okay, this is the website. Uh, 
the way the way on the website you can see you can see the same structure because uh, we have the e-learning on the one side and on the other side we have the mobility uh, the mobility is about the, the architectural workshop so if you go to the side you can see the you can see the results the study the redrawing and the result of the workshop uh, we 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 uh, we did some uh, models all of the same area all of the same frame this is the an area in bologna and so we work about this big area of the of the x marked area and we compare five very different approaches this is the model of the one of the one of one project this is a total different approach this is a poland approach this is parma and french but more interesting is that this uh, this facing the project uh, is uh, made through the redrawing and you can see the redrawing in another part of the site because it is open educational resource we have the redrawing of the open space with five different approach the approach of uh, university of cesena bologna is a monumental structural approach the approach of Aken is a phenomenologic, phenomenological approach to mapping the space of the city or the functionalist functionalist approach of the University of Poland and uh, this idea to compact to densification the city or the tradition of the French uh, the French tradition of architecture is about the natural space well we we, we 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 have to yeah we yeah. run out of time sorry yeah 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 okay but uh, it was fantastic uh, to kind of uh, bring a little bit theory in the debate and also also kind of see a different perspective of more collaborative uh, approach to different countries who work on us for example on the same site and it's very interesting maybe for later we have if anyone has questions but i can kind of jump a few topic about different theories need different representation and different technological so, so that might be interesting for later discussion but anyone has a immediate question that wants to ask lamberto or should i read the next uh, speaker which is alessandro no one okay i'll just gonna present alessandro so i met alessandro five years ago Hi, in rome ah, there is a question oh, okay no, no, I just wanted him to stop sharing the screen. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Well, Thank I met you. Alessandro five years ago in uh, Rome, and he was uh, when I went to Isuf, and and he 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 did the same thing like now, like saying me, don't talk too much, read your things, and uh, so so it's always brilliant to to pre when you combine the energy of Alessandro and uh, and the Italian passion. To do architecture and the mastery so so i will just be very official now and alexandro he's a he's a I say uh, alma mater for, from from a bachelor to phd at uh, sapienza in rome and uh, he's he's been work, doing some practice with uh, sartog architecti Associati for the new M italian embassy in washington and uh, church of jesus holy face in rome and uh, he 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 likes history very much, and how architecture links to history. And he likes to talk a lot, uh, and shows lots of images, particularly uh, long time history and and and, uh, and focusing. He he's currently leading the dynamic research uh, at uh, on urban morphology at Ozegin, Ozegin University. You need to Ozegin. Ozegin University in Ozegin University in Istanbul, and he is responsible for this uh, seminar. So, Alessandro, you have the floor, or you have the screen. Okay, thank you very much, Teodor. Ozegin. So the G is not pronounced; it's um, mute G. Let's say. 
Okay. A geometritos medes ezito. Those who ignore geometry shall not enter. So was written on the entrance of the Academia, uh, the first school of philosophy of the West, founded by Plato near Athens. And now some people believe that you know the teaching of architecture should not be not be technical, should not include geometry, and they claim those people that they are philosophers. I don't know what is the foundation of that assumption. Our, you know foundation is that of the academia, based on geometry. Uh, now, what is the research question about this presentation is, you know, which are the digital tools and the online procedures capable of replacing the traditional design review, what we were doing beforehand, before the coronavirus, the review, the architectural review. But now we have to do it out on, that online. So what is a review? Okay, we gave the definition here, one or more architects drawing on paper to correct a project. Facing the author of the project, in this case a student, but it could be a professional, and also surrounded by other students, which are all of them uh, interact by speaking, mimicking, modeling in space, and eventually drawing, mostly drawing. But what is the online review instead? It is sort of this collective synchronous discussion and assessment of projects drawn, spoken, and spatially modeled, you know, we do it spatial modeling, with a feedback which is saved into a file. So within these, you know, definitions and this research question, uh, let's see what we have done. But first of all, you know, within the debate between four and informal, I would like to say that, you know, university is founded in the Middle Ages and it has its own traditions. Formal communication. A number of people believe, being revolutionary, that, you know, the informal communications should substitute the formal one. And so we can have the two and have a balance. But I believe in formal communication within the university, uh, even though I believe in, you know, uh, opposing this idea. But uh, the interaction is the key word, in my opinion, in teaching. And you can see the interaction of Plato teaching philosophy to Socrates in the so before mentioned academia, or the interaction of Frank Lloyd Wright making reviews to his students. Now, the review, all those who are teaching architecture are probably familiar with this process, okay? And if we want to categorize the review, it is very complicated. Uh, according to most recent researches in, you know, teaching and especially we have these modes of interaction content, student, teacher, student, teacher content, and teacher, teacher. Now, the review, okay, the Frank Lloyd Wright review here is something where the teacher is interacting with the student, but he is interacting with the content. And the student is also interacting with the content in that same time. So it is, in a way, a very complicated, you know, very complex structure in terms of interaction. Well, also, it is both formal and informal. It's not formal because it's not coded. So, you know, it can happen informally, but it's formal in a way because it's like a ritual. It's something that you do uh, in the studio. We do it every week or twice a week. It's individual, you know, he is talking to one student, but all the other students are looking at him. So it's individual and it's collective. It's formal, it's an informal. It's a student content, content um, teacher, teacher, student. So it's probably the most deep and meaningful learning process that we might want to think of, at least according to Anderson and Garrison, who have categorized these modes of interaction. Then, you know, we have these learning outcomes. So these are the learning outcomes of my studio I'm teaching this semester, which is Art 302 Architectural Design Studio 5 at Uzugi University. So these are not exactly Bloom taxonomized learning outcomes, but this is what we have. Analyze construction materials, use construction materials in architectural design, solve problems of building service systems, analyze building systems, implement building, and apply all of the above in the integrated way to the design process. Now, these are the learning outcomes. So this is what we should have, you know, coming out of our students in the studio. And how, I mean, and then now that we're doing it online, 
we asked ourselves, what are the reviews available to, what are the tools available to do these kind of reviews? So some of these results are also already published online on this uh, link here. Um, and let's go quickly to uh, examine some of these options. One is the integrated annotate plugin in Moodle platform, which we are using at the, as a learning management system at OCG, which we have, it's very powerful. It, can, it allows you to do annotation directly onto the PDF, which is uploaded into the submission form of the platform therein. And this can be streamed through, we use Microsoft Teams, but it could be Zoom, it could be Meet or anything else. And what is then done on that PDF can be saved directly into the same PDF. So the students can submit his work PDF and then we can have the review or Judy and then save it. And then later on, he can you know, download that same PDF and have the annotation saved on that file, just as if he would come to the review with his piece of paper and we put you know, our marks over there. And we have been using this for the Judy's in the studio. The uh, the whiteboard, the Microsoft whiteboard, which is integrated within the Microsoft Teams is another very powerful package which we, we have been using and testing. And um, it's it's very you know versatile, much more versatile than the admutation option you have here in Zoom because it allows you to save the result into, and people can upload their JPEG on, or PDF, I think as well, onto the, uh, Board and then so the student can upload his file and the teacher can do the annotation and then you can save this, the whole thing and for future reference. We have been using this for uh, reviews. Then there is in Microsoft Teams, which we're using, you know, the OneNote um, notebook, class notebook, which is integrated there. And there students can put their JPEGs and we can comment them directly online using the Microsoft Teams. We have been doing this in the first part of our studio, of our online studio, um, for the reviews. Then we have discovered the, uh, we have tested the Google Classroom ad notation uh, function within the assignment module, which is, you know, versatile, but it, it, it only allows these written comments and, you know, squares and circles, I think. So that it's not possible to draw. So that is something that could be used for different functions, but not probably for the studio. Um, we have discovered the Google Jamboard, which is integrated within the um, educational suite of Google, uh, which was not activated uh, within Otsugi University. So we had it activated and now it's working. And so we're doing reviews with this. We're gonna give you a live demo of this in a few seconds. Uh, it is highly interactive. Students can upload their uh, drawing there. The teacher can make the comments on top of the of that file, and then it can be saved somewhere for future reference. But also, more than one person can do the same interaction on on top of that same drawing. <clears throat> and we're going to be testing this in a few seconds. We have also tested the online whiteboard for real time visual collaboration which works almost the same as Jamboard with even, for some things it's even better, but it is you know, a limited trial uh, option. You would have to pay to get the free, the complete function, which we could not afford in this phase. I, I also asked the pricing for the company and I share that pricing with our dean and head of department. I would like to salute uh, our head of department. He is here, Professor Murat Shaheen. But we did, we get we did, we don't get the we didn't get the, the money to do this. Finally, the Belkin Stage Pro, which is a paid app, but it is free for Android, which is something you can use to comment online uh, drawings, but also models, maquette. So it can take a picture or a video of any you know reality you have in front of yourself, including a, a real site to survey. Uh, or a building, and then you can make marks on top of that in real time. Okay, so within all these different options, we tested uh, and practiced uh, two different 
orientations. One is the formal review, what we call the duty. So midterm, final duty. And we did this in a very formal way of, with using these tools, the rubric. So that's a written piece of paper, a PDF file in this case, with all the information about the evaluation process and the details of the submission. So all the rules of the game, that's very important. Uh, because being online and far away from each other, if you don't share transparently the rules of what you're doing, you cannot get the transparency and the trust with the students. And then we use Moodle for the submission, and then we use Google Files to share those you know, submissions with the Judy members, and then we use Google Meet for the Judy to meet. And then uh, we made, we, Giorgio Vettiani was with us in the Judy, so he knows. We collected all the, you know, all the drawings into one big PowerPoint, which we saved as a PDF, shared the PDF with the Judy, and the Judy made individual annotations on that PDF within their own annotation program. And we sent back that same file to the students for uh, feedback. This is our Judy right there. And um, uh, this is the rubric. And that is the meeting done on Google Meet. But also, we had a evaluation form, which was using Google file, uh, a spreadsheet on Google. So every Judy member could put his evaluation in here. And then we stream uh, synchronously the comments of the Judy with the students using the Google Meet and the PDF annotation tools. And this is one example of one annotated file with, and this was done with a PDF editor on iPad with an Apple Pencil. And the informal review, which is what you usually do every week or twice a week in the studio, when the students come to you and say, Hojam, can I show you my project? Yes, sit down. And you know, you start drawing on top of that, but other people join. And that's an informal gathering, which we have to distinguish. It's different from the Judy or the exam. And we did this with, in, in the last time we're doing it with Google Jamboard and Microsoft Teams for the meeting, for the streaming. Um, and these are some examples of those um, reviews, which are basically, this is a JPEG. JPEG is loaded on the Jamboard by the student, and then I'm making my comments there on top, and then he can save for a reference the JPEG with the annotations. And, but the whole thing is happening stream asynch synchronously, so everyone is listening. And then we also save the video and we stream it asynchronously for those students who could not take part in the meeting and they might want to take part later for uh, electricity problems. Uh, I mean, one of our uh, collaborators, Otsuge Otsukuvanshi, she helped us with the organization of the conference. She cannot be here now because there's no electricity in her district in Istanbul at this moment. And so she cannot, you know join us. So we're going to record this meeting and also save it and stream it later for those who cannot attend. And these are other of those drawings. We're going to do a live demo of this in a second with the help of Singe Alak, who is one of our uh, graduating students at the Department of Architecture. Um, and this is another. These are from Design Studio 5. and. Um, we're going to do a live demo right here with the help of Odzge, who is not online, unfortunately, and Simge Alak. So I'm going to now go onto an iPad, uh, onto the iPad, and I'm going to start sharing my screen there so that you can see directly, hopefully, hopefully, you never know what happens here, you know, you never know what happens. You never know, so it seems to be working. Uh, you're going to see directly what happens on my iPad. So what you see there is the Jamboard. And now I'm going to ask Simge to help us out by loading one of her drawings okay. there. Right now I'm loading a document. It's uploading right now. So this is what we use for reviews. Students can load their uh, drawings up there. 
but also what is most important you can see this not only through the video as you are doing it now but through the link so if you open the same link i have given you before if you wish can you can you copy it onto the chat also when you've done please yeah okay. uh, seem gear you can open the same page we're in and see it directly on your browser and we did not open this function right now for you to make comments as well but it, because 75 people oh my god too many we got 75 people here in the conference but usually our students are allowed themselves to make you know comments on top of this because okay you're, and you, and you're, you're 15 minutes an hour so focus <laughs> it's done it's done so the point is you know that you know, there's a problem with the road on the outside here okay so this uh, vehicle road is cutting the access to the uh, pedestrians from the from the uh, seashore to the building itself so the building becomes isolated. Now I do suggest that instead you, you know, take this vehicular road out and design some kind of, you know, surface, you know, on the ground as a public space and just, you know, so sketching a possible pattern so that the building is not isolated by the, you know, by the rest of the, of the waterfront. And you can do this also. We have different line with different colors. And so just to show you the functionality of this. Um, uh, okay, thank you very much. Now let's go back to my presentation here, which is finished. I beg your pardon. Um, that was a really good presentation. You have nice comments. Uh, Wait a minute. I got a new, uh, just show to show you what is behind the scenes. So what do you have seen here now? Okay, what is happening behind the screen is this. So we got three computers. One is for the streaming, one is for the large view, one is for the small, and one is the iPad with the uh, Apple Pen, the Apple Pencil. And to conclude, we would like to quote Louis Henry Sullivan, to teach is to touch the heart and impel to action. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. That was really good. Very nice comments in the chat, if you can see. They have some very quick question well, before. So, so one of the questions was, well, how about working in teams? How do you cope with uh, lots of people? Uh, like when you need to share probably different oh, parts of the, or we do it in the end. Let's because in the end, okay. Let's go with the next one, please. Okay, next presentation. That's professor, it. Professor Todor, uh, before passing to the other presentation, uh, Professor Alessandro mentioned my name. It's impossible to say a, a few things if you allow me. Yes, please. Uh, quickly, uh, quickly. But, okay, thank you. By this means, I would like to thank you and then uh, thank the organizing committee on behalf of the faculty of my school and on myself. Uh, uh, also, uh, thanks for the contribution of the speakers and the lovely participation. And then wish you a fruitful meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Ajahn. See you soon. Inshallah. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, then I'm, go, uh, I'm going to present uh, Giorgio Verdani, who is Associate <laughs> Professor at uh, Florence. Department of Architecture, uh, and uh, uh, he uh, he works uh, with uh, cards and computer graphics. Is that correct? And, uh, and, and, uh, and he's also pro uh, there is a uh, well, probably digitalization, and uh, he has been uh, a professor also in. Uh, Architecture Faculty in University of Tirana, Albania. Yes. yes. And uh, he's, uh, he focuses on computer graphics, but also uh, cultural heritage. And uh, yes, uh, cultural and built heritage. So, uh, Giorgio, the screen yes. is yours. Yes. And uh, I'll start uh, your lap. Uh, I, I, okay, I, I, I kind of save the time here on the stopwatch. Okay, perfect. So, here we go. So, thank you for your presentation, first of all. 
I am glad for the invitation and for being here to present this uh, really short resume about the recent activities for the online uh, teaching, meeting, and collaboration. Uh, first of all, a short list of the presentation because I like to call the process presented from uh, Alex uh, Alessandro to uh, the one-to-one -one process because most of the time there is the professor, there are the students, but most of the time is a direct uh, contact and then move to what happens when you need a work group. So you are not thinking about a relationship between one-to-one, -one, just the meeting, the review, the revision of the drawings, but you needed to establish a collaborative uh, environment. So we, we are going to talk about the Autodesk uh, 360 and the uh, Dassault 3D experience, which are quite different in the end. And uh, so starting from the one-to-one -one process, just uh, some short notes about the fact that, well, the, the all of us uh, as uh, professors or as uh, students as experienced in these days, uh, uh, this is a situation where most of the time you have a call with a certain tool, with a certain software that all of you to work together on uh, the same screen and you start mixing together various items, various solutions. Several heritage and built heritage is the for example, the Sketchfab platform, because it allows you to see 3D models, to uh, talk about details, to see directly the 3D model in all its parts, is extremely uh, efficient also for presenting um, cultural heritage items, uh, art history elements, and so on. And maybe you know it too well, but it's a sort of YouTube for the 3D models. Where you put your 3D model, you add all the information you want about the work you have done, and then you can move, rotate, explore the element, check the, um, the geometry uh, of, the, of the object, and, and study well the object. So, uh, this is extremely uh, well working, but it needs some work behind because you work with it well when you have a collection of items. So, for example, just yesterday, just to make a sample, just to start a new degree thesis about the towers of the Mediterranean coast, we have a meeting with the student uh, trying to define is a subject and analyzing various towers along the Valencian coast we have in our archives online in Sketchfab. So it's easy to uh, check together the models, to uh, make a check to inside, uh, for example, Google Maps you know, or Google Earth in real time, check the, the positioning, the place of the uh, various castle uh, fortification system, and then switch back to the 3D model and take a look uh, to the exterior or even to the interiors when they are available, and a study with the student about uh, the shape, the similarities, uh, the uh, very specific aspect of the building. And so, what's in the end? That the one-to-one -one, uh, procedure is obviously extremely interesting, but uh, it has some very strong uh, point, for example, the natural presence of one a guidance of the administrator that uh, try to uh, organize and chair the meeting. Then you have a lot, the continuous possibility of mixing things that are is extremely positive. As, as Alex Alessandro just showed, it's possible to switch between different software and the user get a lot of information from the available materials. And then during the meeting, you have an extended voice and chat support and all you need to talk with the people that are with you. And this can take time sometimes, even more than a standard meeting. 
uh, in, a, in a room. But there are some uh, negative aspects, like, for example, that uh, most of the time, a lot of the meeting, a lot of the uh, things that are said and uh, annotated are not structured in a rational way. There are various files, and they are not a part of a project about developing or discussion about a single uh, topic. And, and also, the, um, in most of the situation, is a one side of set of operations. So the professor, the uh, chair of the meeting, uh, draw lines, add information, but there is no a collaborative environment. Most of the time is one side operation. This can be uh, better because in time it's possible to imagine that people start to work together on it. But at now, most of the time is uh, a one side uh, situation. And then, obviously, everything is afflicted, maybe afflicted by the streaming quality because you put together various uh, software, you try to use uh, video and uh, 3D models in real time. This can be a little bit tricky from the point of view of the quality of the stream. And uh, so uh, how can we consider to start moving to, uh, from the one-to-one -one situation to a war group, to something that allows you to collaborate? One of the very, very easy to access a solution may be, for example, the uh, platform of Autodesk, the very basic A360 A3 and 60 uh, platform that for the academics is free, for the students is free, and all of you to put it together in a very simple uh, interface uh, projects like this one, a very simple project to create a set of files inside the project and then work on it using annotation, using um, uh, collabor collaborative tools. This is quite uh, efficient because all of you to create a group of participants, then go to files that can be uh, DVG or PDF or image files, and then open the, for example, the PDF with or without annotation. Any size is okay, even large PDF can be used easily. And then add extra annotation, make your consideration, and do the classic. Uh, work about uh, reading the present notes, adding new and so on. But very nice, you can work directly on the DVG files and you have a nice set of tools that allow you to add uh, notes, to add uh, um, detailed uh, things that are with a note and then you can take a measurement, you can make your consideration may uh, control the sites of the spaces and so on. This can be done by more than one opera uh, operator at the same time. And you can add your notes, uh, various extra information and complete the work with uh, extra, extra uh, details. And when you have done, you save the notes, the file, you have not edited the DVG, but you have a set of node, notes that are uh, overlapping the original DVG. So for the uh, student who wants to work, you can download the back or simply take a look to the screen and edit all the things, but this is shared between all the students in the group. And once more, recently, uh, Autodesk added a completely uh, online tools, the Fusion, 3D uh, modeling that can be used completely online. So you don't need the software on your computer, you use it online. Obviously, when you start working with it, Autodesk show you that it is an experimental tool. So uh, pay attention because it's a preview of the final one, but you can use it 100% and it works extremely well. So you can use the classical tools for modeling, it may remember since the beginning of Fusion in a certain way, it looked like a sort of uh, av advanced SketchUp uh, uh, interface, but 
is quite fine and you can export toward the full version. Now, the Autodesk 3N60 has various advantages. It's extremely direct, easy to use. There is a very good support for various formats. And there is the possibility to ex even extend the sharing. You can create a group large as you like, give different priority or uh, characteristic to the participant. And then there is a very interesting integrated software that allows people to enter in contact with a modern interface, a very good tool for modeling. The problem are that you have a very essential interface, so it's very, very basic, and there is no real editing tools for the DVG because you simply add notes, you cannot edit, move, or transform the DVG. There are no compliant PDF functions, so you edit the PDF, you add the notes, but then you cannot save an edited PDF or you have to print it back again, so it's a little bit tricky. And then there are no direct editing tools for image, but very nice. It is completely free for the academic environment. If you want more than this, not the student, but the university has to pay. And this is even a little bit expensive. You have to move to the Beam 3 and 60, and then you have a lot of more tools, and you can edit uh, the models, you can uh, share the Revit files, and so on. But in this basic version, the fact that you have a modeling tools is extremely interesting. Then, we, recently, we started, but we just stopped a little because of the shutdown, the uh, lockdown of everything, but it is very interesting. We take the a license for a very expensive tool that is the Dassault 3D Experience because they ask for 5,000 euros for 100 of license for the university. But it's an extremely powerful set of tools completely online. So you have to download about one gigabyte of setup, but then you have a complete set of tools that can be shared online. So what happens is that you have uh, uh, the possibility to admin, administer a large group of, of people, up to 100. You can create how, much, how many administrators and uh, students and participants you need. And then what you get is the possibility to create this, what they call a dashboard, that allows people to collaborate to a set of drawing of projects of 3D models of elements. The basic structure recall obviously the uh, modern interface, the latest interface of Katia, and all of you to have a drafting and a drawing at extremely high level of quality. Very nice, you can create a private or, or public element. So you can decide to have a public element that is protected. So you can decide to have element inside the, the same drawing layers that are managed by different people. Then the drawing is the classical CAD system and you have also tools that uh, allow you to uh, set the um, characteristic of the uh, user, so defining them as a manager or simply uh, client or server in the whole process. And you get a extremely powerful tool with a lot of extra tools like modeling of figures, drawing by images, and uh, rendering engine and so on. So it's a complete tool fully online. So it's extremely advanced, allow to create a group of people working on the same project, check the level of work of everyone, and then develop a project that are uh, probably better and extremely fitting the uh, purpose of object design, vehicle design, and so on. And then, little by little, you can start to move also to uh, architectural and beam uh, strategies of representation. This is quite efficient and quickly. We can say that this kind of tools is extremely powerful. Uh, support, uh, there is an excellent support from rich and uh, tools. And there is the possibility to personalize everything. And then when you have finished, you can pass the models and the draft extremely to offline tools. But there are various trouble yet, for example, it is very complex. <laughs> it's about sorry, sorry to uh, remind to... you that you're running out of time, just a little more time for you. 
just to remind you. Sorry for interrupting. Perfect. In one second, that is finished. And so the price, the extremely complex interface, and the structure of work that is not the common for the architects may be a little bit tricky. But for uh, all the rest, it's an extremely powerful tool. So, final conclusion I want to say that in this period, we are using and learning solutions, but uh, we, are, we will be every, uh, extremely happy to go back to the room, to the class. And I think that there is a, the next challenge that is incoming and is about uh, not thinking about the, that exists uh, in class or an online learning. But uh, yet before we start this uh, forced experience, if there was an ongoing about the hybrid learning and teaching, partially online and partially on site. So thank you for your attention and happy to be here with you. Thank you, Giorgio. That was really cool because we, we start from, from those who are kind of, uh, we are entering more professional tools like CAD and hopefully BIM because they probably have a good answer to kind of a teamwork across continents that can be used, but uh, no one has mentioned like Revit or, uh, or, uh, or, uh, or gra uh, Archicad, Graphisoft. I think they have, I'm, I haven't done like, across continents work but uh, but I, I as you said there is a revit uh, 360 yes where you know yes, you yes. can have the beam environment and also oh, yes. it's, it's probably for designing airplanes and kind of uh, these uh, different <laughs> things so it's not really yes. intuitive to architects but thank you any anyone has quick questions and i'm gonna present if there is no i'm gonna go quickly to to malgo to present no other mm -hmm. questions Perfect. Well, I'm going to present Malgo Zata. So I met Malgo Zata a few years ago in Isuf, and she, she's uh, uh, working for a part of the uh, uh, International Society of City and Regional Planners, ISOCARP, where she kind of organizes conferences. She's vice president. But she, she is, uh, she's an associate professor at, uh, at uh, Lodge uh, University, uh, University of Technology. And she's originally architect uh, and uh, has a background in architecture and she has been uh, she's been a Fulbright scholar at MIT at the sensible city laboratory Carlo Ratis laboratory and Amalgo Zata really is interested in morphology particularly uh, historical morphology and the Jewish settlements around uh, around Lodz. so she has a very interesting analysis of how the city uh, transformed over the time uh, after World War II. So, Malgo, are you ready? I have to unmute you. I will. Yes, okay. I am there. Thank you. So, I will perhaps share my screen if I can. Uh, well, uh, one moment, please. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. Okay, and now the presentation. Uh, so, actually, my presentation. Can you hear me? Please tell me. Okay, thank you, Todor. Uh, so, my presentation is going to be slightly different because, uh, well, in here it's not mentioned in the title, but. Uh, uh, well, uh, first I'd like to introduce uh, the courses which I, I am teaching right now. And, uh, and uh, this is mostly the reason why I decided to talk about that. Uh, then I would uh, talk about the main challenge, which in this case, uh, for me at first, it was lack of face-to-face -face contact. Uh, then I'd like to share with you some methods uh, and tips and tricks which might perhaps uh, occur useful for you to uh, tell you so, uh, something about uh, the conclusions uh, and also show some examples. So uh, basically the, the, the topic which I'd like to talk about is uh, lecturing. Uh, lecturing in urban design, uh, uh, it happened uh, 
it just uh, happened that uh, I uh, kind of uh, had to take on uh, uh, several lectures at the same time uh, in the beginning of the semester due to, to various like external circumstances and and uh, there are quite uh, quite many of them at the same time uh, which uh, at first which was quite a huge ch a challenge but after when I got used to that uh, because it's uh, I must admit quite uh, quite challenging to, to switch so quickly to, to this uh, online uh, platform um, it uh, it gave me some breath for thought uh, which which I'd like to share here uh, I teach in Lodz University of Technology as, as Todor mentioned I also uh, I am involved in two courses in Warsaw University of Technology, also in the Faculty of Architecture. Uh, there, actually, I, I had the opportunity to acquire some previous, uh, some former experience when it comes to teaching, uh, as uh, the course which, uh, which I am involved in is, is quite interesting. It's uh, called Architecture for Society of Knowledge, and that first we had to uh, explore, it was 10 years ago, uh, some methods of online teaching uh, so, so this gave me some like uh, previous experience however at uh, at this time while trying to to teach online i am in Wuch and uh, my students uh, well i I, I had such experience that uh, that for some reasons uh, we tried to to kind of uh, uh, collaborate remotely. At the time, it was quite difficult to compete with face-to-face uh, -face activities, uh, and this already I, I was then thinking, okay, it's nice. Uh, I record my lectures, they watch it uh, as a supporting activity, but in general it's kind of visual teaching and while competing with face-to-face -face, uh, it's hard to, uh, to, to get into that. Uh, another element which I'd like to emphasize, which is very nice and which is uh, really uh, kind of helping me uh, right now to, to build uh, all this uh, experience and also give some theoretical insights uh, into that, uh, it's the course which uh, myself and several of my colleagues uh, had the opportunity to take, uh, which was organized uh, uh, by Polish Ministry of Science and Higher Education. Uh, it was called, it is called, because it's still ongoing, Masters of the Didactics. Uh, uh, there were several universities uh, involved as hosts, uh, uh, myself and, and several of my colleagues, uh, we got to University of Groningen in, in, in the Netherlands. And, uh, and actually, uh, well, very similar, similar seminar, only not teaching in architecture, but about general teaching, uh, we had yesterday, which which uh, which actually uh, I find uh, very relevant and and quite useful. Uh, so I'd like to to share a little bit of this experience. So as I said, uh, the first uh, and major challenge of these lectures is that I don't see faces of my students. Uh, so normally I would have an auditorium with uh, with uh, well in here it's uh, it's final re presentation of students' projects. That's why they they express so much attention but but normally I have an auditorium there is around 50 30 or 70 people there and uh, or, or a bit more but uh, but I see their faces I see their reactions to what I am presenting and I feel less or more confident uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's all fine I know whether they listen whether it's uh, uh, interesting or, or not that much uh, and uh, and I, I can react and uh, well change the tone of my speech uh, uh, and, and right now uh, suddenly I found myself in this situation that I have no idea what they think uh, whether it's boring or not so I started thinking okay so perhaps it should be done a little bit uh, differently so this is this main uh, question and a little bit of of what uh, what I thought uh, after that that uh, well uh, there should be a slightly higher level of interaction in order to deal with this monotony because well also observing for instance my own daughter when she participates in some online activities 
sometimes when it's uh, particularly boring, she just starts watching films or, or doing some other things. Uh, so, so it's of course uh, not necessary to, to include too many distractions because uh, it should be formal and it's university, but, uh, but still uh, perhaps we should do something about that. Uh, one uh, one thing which I noticed is uh, that in, along with increased interaction, uh, which uh, can take on various forms, uh, we uh, might uh, involve our students more. Uh, this uh, interaction might be either direct, related to synchronous uh, communication or indirect. And then it might take on such forms as quizzes, assignments, and tasks. Uh, of course, there are also other obvious methods like tests, online lessons, which enable students to practice and repeat. Uh, there uh, should be also some references to things which the audience are familiar with. This might uh, help uh, them to, to understand simply and, and interact. Uh, another set of solutions is related to this second element, so decreased monotony. We might use various media, but of course without exaggeration. Uh, we might use books, we might read them loud, uh, we might uh, show uh, pieces of text, we might recommend further sources, uh, we might require reading, uh, we might embed some films. Uh, perhaps I am telling you obvious things, but uh, but we need to realize that uh, when, when we don't do that, uh, it's simply go, uh, going to be that monotonous and boring that, that uh, nobody would like to, 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 to follow. Uh, we shouldn't avoid repetitions. This is something which I really learned. Uh, uh, we sometimes should uh, start with some message afterwards, uh, explicitly uh, tell our audience what they are expected to learn from this, and afterwards summarize the content so they are sure that they understand properly. And it's also good to question about this uh, summary and the most important pieces uh, which uh, should come out of that. A pinch of humor is also welcome. What's more, uh, on the other hand, there are constraints. Uh, some students have got uh, quite complicated access to technology. There are also situations in their lives, uh, which I call here social background, but uh, for instance, some of my students, they work in, in for example, some, uh, some uh, you know, health uh, services. Uh, there are such people. So, uh, so we need to realize that they wouldn't have time to, to contribute uh, in the synchronous way. Uh, so we should uh, uh, realize that there should be some part of flexibility. We need to be gentle both to ourselves and to our students. We need to give necessary time. Uh, well, the sense of humor, which I'm repeating here, but another thing which is quite uh, relevant and important and should be uh, taken into account is the uh, very fact that there are tasks which can be both synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, this uh, diagram which I am showing on the right, it comes from the presentation uh, which uh, actually I heard yesterday uh, by Tracy Peltzer uh, from University of Groningen. She, she quotes here another, uh, another instructor. And uh, it is there emphasize that this discussion, which is synchronous form of communication, should be part of the larger teaching process. And this teaching process actually might consist of asynchronous communication and this synchronous communication, which should be a sort of unique event uh, accompanied by these other phases, uh, it should be something which needs to be valued because we need to find this time to be together uh, it doesn't have to be the only form of communication. We might, uh, we, we should realize, and, and this slide also, I, I kind of, uh, well, it's not exactly the, the origin, uh, but I, I got very strongly inspired by what we were showed. Uh, 
uh, and uh, well they uh, emphasize the uh, the uh, necessity to distinguish these two forms of communication and uh, what is quite interesting in this we we should uh, design the whole process of uh, of online uh, teaching uh, which combines both forms uh, then we are able to uh, to provide uh, much easier let's say path for students to follow uh, this requires uh, a little bit of empathy and uh, quite a lot of actually work and and and, and thinking uh, well i'd like to to share a little bit of technical background as well and and some of the experience so for instance uh, as when it comes to the to the platform which we use uh, uh, we we have got a specially craft, crafted software for uh, our university. We use a, a webinar platform which is based on click meeting software. It's a, it's a company as far as I know, it's German. It's a worldwide. Uh, as the background platform, we use VCamp, which is adjusted Moodle. It's also a little bit uh, modified uh, Moodle, uh, but with all the functions uh, of Moodle. Uh, well, I'd like to illustrate some of these uh, statements which uh, which I just uh, gave. So, for instance, uh, about this, uh, you know, showing of books. Actually, uh, this I find uh, extremely useful that uh, I can uh, use these online platforms because finally I can, you know, uh, not uh, carry all these books to to the university in order to to show them to students. I can just simply. Uh, tell them what is in the book, what is this about, and uh, and uh, and recommend it. And and I, I seriously uh, find this uh, this <laughs> small piece uh, quite quite useful uh, because it uh, makes me, I think, uh, much more uh, convincing. Uh, also, uh, going further, an example of an assignment. Uh, uh, well, uh, I I, try, I tested it in different, uh, let's say, uh, conditions. This is just an example uh, of one of uh, various assignments uh, uh, I am uh, using. And in here, uh, well, I tested in asynchronous and asynchronous uh, communication. So, uh, so we we had some small chat and discussion about this topic. Uh, we also, I also ask students to write their opinion. I notice that when they are uh, given time to reflect after, uh, it's often much richer than uh, than uh, than the answers which they dare uh, to give in public. This is also quite uh, quite interesting. I'm also trying to use very simple uh, charades. Uh, for instance, I define uh, attendance keys, uh, which, uh, in order to register the presence, uh, which are not like straightforward names or very complicated uh, uh, chains of signs, but uh, I look for some questions so, so they memorize uh, at least one word or one uh, name. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, other forms of uh, of interaction uh, especially with asynchronous communication uh, well i for instance I, we managed recently there was a, a film urbanized by gary hastwit uh, uh, shown online so so i asked students questions about uh, this watched film uh, I'm trying also, and this has also been emphasized uh, by these uh, researchers from Groningen, I'm trying also to give them assignments in order to train them uh, in some uh, competences. Uh, this is not so obvious in, in groups of, uh, you know, 70 students or, or so, uh, but when, when some activities are repeated based on various examples, after a while they really master uh, some skills and, and it, uh, it works. Uh, for one of the lectures, they are actually... Malgo, 15 minutes, sorry. Okay, I am, this is the last slide. Okay, good. So, <laughs> Uh, they are actually creating a, a small, uh, let's say, uh, task, uh, which is a small project of a calendar for the participatory uh, scenario. 
uh, well, lessons and, and exams, it's, uh, it's quite obvious. Uh, for synchronous communication, it's more ad, ad hoc, but it's also important so students just concentrate. And this can be just chat, conversation, Kahoot questions are very good, so really people take part. There are also other types of polls uh, uh, for tutorials, but this is the topic for another discussion. We use uh, freehand in design and Miro with Microsoft Teams. I, I, I polled my colleagues and, and I noticed that this is very useful and, uh, and uh, well, gives a lot of possibilities for, uh, for interaction, especially this in design, I like it very much. Uh, well, thank you for your attention. No, oh, thank you. That was really nice, a kind of a perspective on, uh, on how to understand online teaching, not really on the process, but also a deeper kind of, uh, how to say, a deeper uh, or, or wider perspective on online teaching. So, uh, anyone has a quick question or we just go, I'll just go to, to Frederick. Well, uh, uh, Frederick is a, is, is, a, is a practicing architect and a, a adjunct professor at Pratt University in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, he is a, he's a fellow of the American Academy in Rome and uh, coordinator of the uh, undergraduate architecture Rome program. My, 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 my little one is kind of getting here a bit annoyed, my apologies. And, uh, and he has, uh, we, we talked a few days ago, and he has a really interesting uh, tool to show uh, about when you cannot travel the cities, how you can uh, analyze cities or with walkthroughs. So, Frederick, I hope, so the screen is yours. Uh, are you? I'm on, thank you, thank Great. you so much. Yes, let me, uh, let me start my screen. So uh, let me just first say thank you so much for including me in your online tools and strategies seminar. And thank you also to Tom Rankin for introducing me to uh, Dr. Kamiz. Um, so can you see that? There we go. Um, so I'm the academic coordinator for Pratt Institute's undergraduate architecture Rome program. Pratt Institute is a 125-year-old art and design school based in Brooklyn, New York. Its Rome program is now approaching its 50th year. Every spring, we take 40 students, about one-third of our fourth-year class, to Rome for a full semester. We promote the program for its independent and unique curriculum within the larger professional degree matrix. It's different, of course, because it's a fully experience-based learning using the city as the classroom for every one of the six courses that make up its 20 credits. Just very quickly, the curriculum, uh, located in the fourth year of a five-year professional degree program, like all of our semesters, it is centered on the five-degree design studio. Everything else supports that. Uh, the design problem that students engage is supported directly by an urban studies course about which I'm going to return to, as well as a freehand sketching course which documents the space of the city. These courses are complemented by two history classes, Rome as Spectacle, looking at Renaissance and Baroque transformations, and Modern Italian Architecture, which is engages the more radical departures of the 20th century. Of course, in Italian language, uh, completes the curriculum. So the methodology. All of the courses engage the city of Rome as a classroom. The design studio through its initial exercise and citing of its principal problem, both of which involve repeated visits to recommended locations as a way to form more direct personal responses to faculty recommendations. The sketchy course reflect, selects identifiable moments within that urban fabric that can summarize urban sensibilities. Roma's spectacle and modern Italian architecture are classes that rely on excursions, not slide lectures, to directly present the material and communicate a deeper understanding. Even the Italian language course engages the city with learning exercises that take place at 
coffee bars, restaurants, food kiosks, and even the train station uh, in ways that are probably more typical for a language class to celebrate at its conclusion. All of this, I'm sure, is well understood to anyone engaged in seated foreign studies programs. The city is the locus of learning, or as I like to say about our program, it is the encounter, the physical encounter with the city of Rome, a place foreign yet familiar, profound and contradictory, that challenges one's design priorities. So back to Brooklyn and then to online learning. Our own program's move to online learning came in two steps. Following the announced COVID outbreak in Lombardy, the Institute convened a task force to address their situation. Within three days, they had made the unprecedented decision to bring the students back to Brooklyn. Uh, but then they had to confront the question, you know, should they continue with the same coursework now that they were no longer in Rome? The answer was yes, they could continue with their design studio as always, just in a new space to be set up for them. They could continue to sketch the city, only this time New York City. They could continue to take their walks for the history courses, only the plan was to convert those to documentary-like videos uh, that could be watched and discussed over online pla platforms. The uh, language class would be the only one that would probably uh, sort of engage a new faculty member back in Brooklyn. And then just as the new space for them was being completed, coincident with their 14-day quarantine, the Institute closed its campus and went to online learning. Because of our advanced preparation, this wasn't as difficult as it could have been. All of the classes moved then to the same online platforms that we're be, we're, we are discussing today and are being used in other locations, in particular Zoom and Google Meet. The original intention to film the necessary walking tours had to be canceled as Rome's stay-at-home order eliminated that as a possibility. The walking tour classes then all reverted to more traditional slide lectures, except one course, and that was our urban studies course. The urban studies course engages in a deeper exper experiential examination of Rome by first identifying the city's critical identities as layers. The classical city centered on the forum and its extension as armature to the gates in its walls, the labyrinthine medieval city centered on the Campo Marzio, the Baroque city characterized by Sixtus V's axial network, the 19th century capital city expansion, but also intervention into its fabric to plant a new national identity, and then the radical erasures of the 1930s to symbolically link the fascist state to its Roman and Augustan origin. The distinctive spatial character of each of these walks, each running several hours, but always remaining embedded within a particular character of a particular layer or historical era was a necessary device in communicating urban differentiation. While the walks could have also been translated into slide lectures, we decided to experiment with the option to film canceled. The question was, could Google Earth uh, together perhaps with iMovie for editing actually be a, a, a reasonable vehicle? It turned out that it could. Perhaps somewhat low-tech in one way, it turned out to be an interesting way to synthesize material. Maps, historical representations, early photographs, all could be brought together with narration while moving in Google Earth's virtual space. Uh, here on the screen is the itinerary for our fourth layer or fourth walk, the late 19th century intervention that created the modern Corso Vittorio Emanuele Due. Uh, and so I'm going to show you a, a very brief four minute sort of edited clip from this particular walk, uh, the road from Pope to King. So here it is. Let's hope it, uh, it starts up without any problems. What you see is that it's really broken down into two sort of strategies. The first strategy is one 
that I would say is more consistent with the way that he had described it, right? It's a very careful surgical incision into the fabric of the city. And so, when, and so zooming out, we're going to see the Ponte Vittorio as our first point of departure. And we're gonna end up at Piazza Venezia. Okay, here we go. And um, so what you can see here, we're, now we're gonna swing around and uh, there's a bridge from the river view and head down the Corso, the road from Pope to King. And uh, just pausing here at the sort of entrance threshold, we have, uh, we see the kind of section that this wide street presents to us. Remember this was, so now we're continuing down the course and so now we're gonna turn back to the left and look to an, the other sort of central artery of that trident. There you see the Castle San Angelo perfectly lined up with that. And of course, once again, we see in, in the distance, we see uh, the Church of San Andrea della Valle and that's giving us a kind of character, right? That's the, that's the element that now begins to distinguish this street as not being a typical European street. Is, this is now, an, this is an important moment on the walk because it's where the Via Papalis sort of conjoins with the Corso Vittorio Emanuel. Yeah, so everything on the right is sort of rebuilt and, and what was on the left as we were passing through there was remaining. And now we're, we're, we're basically given a kind of wide open space in order to negotiate where we're going to be going, which is over here on the left. We'll, we'll, we'll pause for a second. We'll look over the uh, Largo area excavation site. Um, I wanted to just pause here for a second. So, so the set in this case, the south side of the street is original fabric and the north. And I, Yes, the south side and the north side to the left is all the reconstructed facades. And uh, from about the center line, maybe even a little bit further over of the street, that has been pulled back. So you can see how originally this would have had a more, so, so I, would, I would agree that this has a more careful sensibility to it. So arriving at the Jesu now and turning to the right, uh, what we see now is the axes that leads up to uh, the Campidoglio, and here it is in the uh, in the Noli plan, which you're all familiar with, because in fact this is the area of your site, um, the Piazza Rocelli at the bottom of the Campidoglio, um, and so this is where the Via Papalis then turns right and continues over to the Campidoglio, but our uh, Corso Vittorio will continue straight along the side of this. and uh, ultimately then entering the Piazza Venezia uh, with Mussolini's urban ideas. Okay, so now here you see, here you see the monument. What you see, so that was the clip. Um, I showed you just a few seconds at the end of um, a film that was embedded there, uh, Roman Holiday. Uh, the idea was that with each one of these uh, walks at the end, there was a desire to sort of bring in its somewhat similar sort of understanding or, or representation of the city uh, that had been already produced through film. And, uh, you know, so it, it's, it's just one of the things that I think, you know, I mentioned, you know, we can, you can integrate, uh, you know, sort of still imagery, uh, older maps. Uh, uh, the, the final walk that we did, which actually uh, was uh, uh, the Via del Mare, 
uh, that was uh, you know part of the whole fascist regulating plan, which which was ex with its extensive demolition, uh, was less heavy on the maps and and more focused on the sort of continuation that the the continuation of the of the passage. Uh, which was would be more consistent with the idea of traveling in an automobile as opposed to being, being a pedestrian who is consistently stopping and sort of observing. Uh, so um, I, I have to say that, I, you know, this has been the production of these, uh, because this, the, the course was already, uh, let's say, a third of the way through its content, uh, we were basically picking up and producing the last three of the sort of five layers. And it was quite exciting to to engage in this. Um, so I'm I'm of a mixed opinion as to whether or not I think this is, you know, sort of low production value or it's appropriate production value in a funny sort of way. Um, you know, certainly, you know, I, I throw up some conclusions here, which is that this could actually be something that gets sort of reinvested, whether we're meeting face to face or not, uh, because it presents different. You know, it presents it presents, a, it presents a kind of uh, critique of the notion of the 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 slide lecture, which of course has this sort of long history now uh, in terms of the way to communicate uh, architectural history to, to you know to students, but which has always relied then since the lantern slide on this kind of still image, and the uh, and the sort of let's say repercussions of that. Uh, unintended, in many cases, repercussions of, of that, which is to sort of always be looking at architectural form as these sort of standalone elements um, and not having the opportunity to sort of really engage the context in which things are always operating. Um, and it just seems to me that there's a kind of a greater wide open possibility here if one were to, to, to begin to, tr to try to utilize this as a real um, strength to sort of, to sort of focus almost entirely on context as opposed to object. Um, so that was, um, that was really my whole presentation. I think I'm, uh, I'm not using up my whole time. I, I, I give that back to the chair. <laughs> no, but that was a fantastic presentation. Very nice comments. You got lots of nice comments. You can read them later. I, uh -huh. I, I absolutely find it amazing because, I mean, we, we, whenever we do this uh, conference at, at the East of, we always organize small tours. So all the, I usually joke that uh, urban morphologists are the best tour guides of cities. So, uh -huh. so there's always some urban morphologists walking us around and, and uh -huh. explaining us all the small details. But this is fantastic because it's also documented. It's kind of like an extra YouTube movie of, yeah. the, of a kind of a personal, uh, uh, kind of a, like a travel journey, but professionally done. Mm -hmm. So, so it's amazing. So I don't know if anyone has again a question very quick uh, for, for, for Frederick. Uh, uh, I definitely have one question because I mean, uh, no one, uh, well, well, I search for my, uh, Rome is very interesting. For example, San Clemente, the church has three levels, one above each other. Yeah. Have you uh, ever managed to grasp this kind of multi layeredness of uh, through the two of the one, uh, through the like uh, the Google uh, walk through. Google, well, I have to say Google Earth. Google is, Earth, yeah. Google Earth has a, a rather remarkably extensive uh, file set that is, of course, available to you, but it does not go everywhere. Yeah, it's not perfect. <laughs> uh, so there are there are mis there are gaps. There are gaps even on the streets of Rome. There are gaps. Uh, that we came upon because the first one we did was walking Sixtus the Fifth's plan, which, by the way, when doing that in real life, takes too long to do in the course of a class. But in this case, we can do almost the entire thing. Uh, but we just dis discovered a few gaps in the whole process. No, but it's a, it's a great. Just Rome was the only city in the world who has many levers in the same building, so you can kind of look at it. So it was if it will work everywhere. I stop. Next presentation. Thank you. That was really as any very a bit different perspective, but lots. Now we have Tom Rankin from. Uh, uh, so he's an American architect with a master uh, he, master in architecture from Harvard and BA from Princeton and uh, Laurea from uh, architecture in architecture from Sapienza in Rome. 
and he has lived in Rome practicing architecture and teaching since 1991. And, uh, and Tom uh, teaches at Sapienza, the Cali uh, California Polytechnic uh, Rome program of architecture and Iowa State Rome program. And he's also a Fulbright scholar, uh, former director of non-profit association uh, Terno Onlus and American Institute of Roman Culture. So, uh, uh, Tim, uh, are you, you have the screen. Thank you, Todor, yes. And, yes, uh, thank you. Okay. You covered, you covered it all there. <laughs> yes, um, thank you. I'm gonna just pull up my, um, hold on a second, share content. I'm doing this from my iPad, which is an experiment for me. So I have, uh, slideshow here so you should be seeing virtual walks in real places right let me know if that's yes. showing up on the screen okay great thanks so this is uh it's fantastic to follow uh my friend frederick who has really introduced more more than introduced the same kind of subject that i want to address um, i'm going to take my time to have this be more of a um expanding and expounding on this notion of how we uh, take our students to places that they can't physically be in. I mean, I'm very, in my work, I'm very concerned, I'm very interested in, in place, in practices of place and place making. And, um, and like Frederick and, and his class, much of what I do in teaching is out on site, in the field, in places. Um, I want to start with with Goethe. It's always good to start with Goethe. And I often tell my students um, as I'm preparing them to come to Rome, not to worry too much because Goethe says that only in Rome can one educate oneself for Rome, which kind of uh, undermines everything Frederick just said. Like, forget it. Only in Rome can you educate yourself for Rome. But of course, that's not really true. Um, Goethe himself, in, in a book I have handy here, See, I can pull up my book as well, Italian Journey, um, he talks about how he spent so much time preparing to come to Rome, looking at uh, artifacts that his father had in the mantelpiece in his home, and imagining when he would come to Rome. So there was a lot of preparation, more than our students do today um, and then when he when, when he came to Rome I thought I had another second quote ready to go here but when he came to Rome he said that um, I wish I had bookmarked it I could almost paraphrase it I suppose he said that um, Rome unveils um, something which you could have not expected, that it's much richer than you could have ever expected, and that, you know, finally your life can continue. Hmm. Yeah, and interestingly, my, my slides got out of order. This is part of the technical glitch. Um, let me just view through these to see Okay, well, that's all right. I'm, I'm going to just talk around some of the things that I had hoped to share, unless I can figure out why they're not all showing up here. Um, yeah, this is too bad because I have actually quite a few more slides which have disappeared from this presentation. Bear with me just one minute. If Todar, if you are able to let me into the Zoom meeting from my laptop, I think that would make it much oh, okay. more. Okay. Yes. Of, so, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly open up Zoom on my laptop. Yes. And, no problem. Um, join a meeting. Hopefully, the meeting will still be there from before. If yeah, not, yeah I think so. You, you can join from several. several. Yeah. Okay. Um should be asking to join from another address and as soon as that comes in i'm going to close this one you're in 
Okay, am I in as a second Tom Rankin? Okay, I'm leaving. Ah, uh, yes. There you go, Tom Rankin, The Revenge. Yeah, okay, so Tom Rankin is back. And I know I'm recording. And, okay, now you can see the second good a quote, I believe, right? That was a quick comeback. So as soon as one sees with one's own eyes, the whole which one had hitherto only known in fragments, a new life begins. So the idea that Goethe says, you can know it in fragments, but only when you come to Rome does it come together. Okay, you're following me here, right? Yes. So this is what I normally do. A um, Bunch of American students walk around with me. Sometimes they're not students, sometimes they're adults, interested groups, um, travelers of all sorts. But I take them through the city and we have all these limitations. We can't walk in the middle of the street. It's noisy. They do all sorts of things, not just in Rome, but around Italy. So, and Frederick described very much with images, the kind of work that these study abroad pro programs do, sketching, um, analysis, but of course eating and wading in the cool waters of Sperlunga. There's, there's lots of very physical, very um, you know, sensual moments too. And I think that that's one of the things I want to address. What are the things that we can't capture with this distance technology? So what happens when we go into lockdown? I too was teaching in early, in February and early March. And the moment we started talking about lockdown, I went out and um, started making some videos. And I decided that in this presentation, because of the limits on bandwidth, um, I wasn't gonna stream the videos. What I'm gonna do instead is, um, as soon as I finish up, I will drop into the chat window uh, links to about, at this point, 20 different videos, which um, some of which I shot immediately before the lockdown. As Frederick said, our, our plans of um, presenting our walking tour lectures from Rome were shattered by the lockdown telling us we couldn't go to the places. There's one in which I went out planning to go through the Capitol Line Museums, videotaping it for my students, and they closed the museums that day. So instead I went into some other places, and in this, in this screenshot from the video, you see me walking through Trastevere, holding a selfie stick, speaking to the camera, and trying to engage the viewer, the students, on the kind of virtual walking tour. Okay, so it's a different technology from the one Frederick was showing using Google Earth. Um, this lasted for a few days. I, did, I started a series on my YouTube channel called Re Remote Rome, where each day I um, posted a very, very short one minute video, just tempting people to um, understand a little bit of Rome. They're very, very short though, um, and experimental. And so actually, yeah, I did have a little bit of a video piece in here. So the ability to walk through Trastevere and you know, see it, and, um, and this could then be narrated. Um, at about that point, though, something strange happened and I became completely obsessed with another way of looking at the city through the webcams, which I here in Rome, um, maybe I'm a kilometer and a half from the Spanish steppes, but I was watching the Spanish steppes the way Alessandro in Istanbul or somebody in Tokyo could through a webcam. Now the, here I've just put a still image, but it doesn't matter. This could have been a video. Um, you would see for 10 minutes, nothing happened. And then a person would walk across the stage. And in this case, of course, it's the Piazza di Spagna, so it really is a stage. And I thought how interesting that uh, everybody can now experience a public space in, in a way which if you actually went there, you would be in the picture. If you went to this public space, 
Now here I have cropped it out a little bit. In reality, when you look at the webcam, it has this rather awkward advertisement for a dentist <laughs> and all of the social media links and telling you how many viewers there are. And I, I watched as they grew day by day. So um, that takes away a bit of the romance. I did a lot of screenshot capturing and transformation of these webcams and they're also in the videos that I made. And of course, this is the Spanish steps most of our students know because <laughs> you could never go there and be the only people. And that's the issue with being on site is that you're always, um, you are part of the site. So when I go through Rome with 25 American students, their experience of Rome is a Rome with 25 American students. Strangely, now we have the possibility of experiencing these spaces without our own presence in them by doing it virtually. Now, I too am uh, fixated with Google Earth. At a certain point, I, I didn't get bored with the webcams. They're still fascinating, but I moved on to Google Earth. And I debated whether in this presentation, at this point, I would just stop the slides and switch over to live streaming Google Earth. But then we run into a, a problem of bandwidth, which I think is crucial to this whole discussion. Um, and I think it's temporary. You know, there are some gaps in, in Google still, even in Google, there are gaps. Um, but it's a question of time before bandwidth increases and we're able to do what I can do on my computer, I mean, I can look across time. So right now it goes back to 1941. I can look at the Mausoleo di Augusto over time and see the transformation of time through Google, turning on different layers. Um, but if I want to actually live stream the kind of um, imagery which Frederick was just showing, and I'm really glad he did because that saves me from having to do it myself. As you fly through the city, over the city, um, when I'm connected directly to Google, the resolution is quite good and it's very fast and compelling. If I stream it um, through Zoom to my students, inevitably it slows down, it gets glitchy, and um, it loses a lot of quality. So I'm convinced that that's just a technical glitch. But there's other, I want to make sure I'm in time here. There's other um, limit, there's other possibilities that we have using the same technology. Measurement, okay? We can measure anything we want in Google. So we could actually come and survey a site through Google and if a student is in, say, San Luis Obispo, California, it's actually not so hard for them to measure something in Rome, measure something in their town to compare it to, and understand, even if they can't physically stand outside the Mausoleum of Augustus, they can find something of a similar size in California to associate. So I think measurement is key, uh, and measurement includes, of course, calculating square meters, and all these tools, all these layers, which I won't go into. In fact, there's a whole part of that. Um, and of course, we're not limited to the reality of Google, the world today. We, we can go back into lots of material, which I already share with my students when they're in Rome. We're constantly walking around with the Noli plan and it's a Tempesta plan, but, um, I almost think that it's better for them to look at these when they are back in their apartment or home and they can concentrate on them rather than all of the commotion of seeing these layers. I mean, I, you know, I really agree that by being able to choreograph this without being on site, there are a lot of real advantages. Okay? And then as we get down into the design aspect, and I missed a lot of the discussion earlier because I was simultaneously teaching a group of Sapienza architecture students while your conversation was going on. I'll be watching it in the uh, recording later, but I, I won't spend too much time on all of the tools that we have using overlays, using drawing to inform our students about a specific site. Yeah. 
giving them the, the digital material, giving them the CAD plans, all of that can be shared probably better with the high bandwidth of American universities than it could when the students are actually here in the ghetto, in our facilities with questionable internet. They can even get a file, print out a 3D model where they are in New York or California, work with that physical 3D model and come up with their project, send the file, we print it, we insert it into our 3D model. Okay, so I think, you know, that's design. So that's when design, the design process continues. So what I'm really interested in, what I'm talking about is, how do we give the students the experience of the site? Um, once they're designing, everything comes into play. Digital, analog, if they're on site, if it's remote, you know, it's not this or that, it's both. Excuse me, professor, I need to remind yes. you the time. Yes, time? Yeah. Two minutes. If you could wrap it up. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, great. These are, I think, the last two, couple of slides. Okay. So, all of that I've talked about so far is basically quantifiable data, measurement, all of that scientific stuff. But then the other stuff, the phenomenological, the atmosphere, how do we, how do we capture that? I mean, that's the big question. And I've been, the next thing that I've been doing has been a series of, of drawings which take the scientific, take aerial photography. And in these, I've been using aerial photographs and documenting them, marking them up with commentary. And this is where they get back more into a little bit of Goethe's mentality of contemplation, observation, and theorizing, and just writing them over the Google imagery. Um, so the reading, the writing, the art, all of that, which students can receive at a distance, so it's an interpretation, I think that has to be put in the picture as well. Not just looking at the kind of cold Google imagery of Venice, but reading Ruskin as you're looking at it. And how about that for coincidence, Frederick? I swear I didn't just put that in there. Um, the last thing I want to say is that I think the biggest tool that we have available is film. And I did some research on neorealist films when I first came to Italy, and the notion that realism, um, cinema provides a tool for realism. Um, this project that I'm producing with uh, a colleague, Pia Schneider, at the at Iowa State University is called Urban Realities. And it uses film, cinema, to document the neighborhoods of Rome. And in this uh, screenshot, you see the students in the city looking at you know, the reality. Luckily, we shot all of this just before the lockdown. Uh, so I'm going to put some links into the window there so that if you want to follow up, you can take a look at these films um, and some of the other work that um, presents this. So that's that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Just that was unshare cool. this. Great. Super cool. Uh, Great. Uh, now we we come to the last presentation. Then we're going to go to the questions. So it's Elias, and Elias was born in Athens, Greece, and he he migrated to the U.S where he received his uh, bachelor and master degrees. And, and, and then and Elias is uh, not an architect, but he works with design and, and, and uh, for teaching uh, design and web technology. So it's very interesting. He will come with a completely new perspective on this. And, uh, and he, he's, been, uh, he's been working on interactive maps, voice narration, videos, references to the Bible, original Greek texts, uh, mosaics, frescoes, uh, photographies. So it's, it will be an interesting, a very interesting presentation. Uh, Elias? Thank you, thank you. I'm going to share my screen now, okay? Perfect. Hopefully you can see that. Correct? Can we see that? Yes, we can see. Yes, yes. Oh, perfect. Okay, so hello everyone and thank you for having me. Alejandro, thank you for the invitation and great meeting everyone and listening to what you have to say. The, uh, I'm coming from a completely different part of things. Uh, I, am the, I am part of the architecture department at Oziguiana University and a full-time lecturer at the communication design department. 
So primarily I teach um, animation, mobile interaction design, and um, uh, studio classes. Um, so for this presentation, I want to talk about the communication side of things. Uh, what we as academicians should be doing to deliver our lectures and my approach to do that by working directly with students, adopting methods such as peer-to-peer -peer reviews, custom training tutorials, as well as YouTube lectures. So the, the semester is a special semester, not because, of course, because we are experiencing something that we have not experienced before with the pandemic and the isolation, but also the, um, uh, the challenges we are facing every day. So I want to talk about the communication side of things. Another thing I would like to mention is that the, uh, this semester is a, it's a bit of a different semester for me because it's the first time that I get the opportunity to teach uh, a class from the industrial design department. And a class that is challenged me quite a lot because um, I, I'm not familiar with the students' background. Uh, with you know our design communication department, you know we know this with students very well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm going to get to that a bit later. So the the main goal is the way I see it is to help students feel included in the process of rethinking education during those challenging times. So we must keep an open and clear channel of communication with students. It's a very, very important step. Um, and I, I strive to do this by bugging them a lot uh, through Microsoft Teams. Um, I hope into the Teams a lot, I'm online a lot, and I, I keep asking them if they need help, uh, how do they feel about the project? If they have some ideas they want to share with me. And there is a continuous communication going around, I would say, in daily basis and completely outside the class hours. Uh, of course, <laughs> that's on my time, but you know, it has its benefits. So, uh, the way I now I'm going to go to the next slide is that right now knowledge is just a click away and the role as educators must change as well. So we are lucky today with the worst technology has improved so much and we have these tools that we can use and but what we have to do is we have to up our game. Uh, so the challenge for the teachers is to transfer the skills online. So it's time for us to rethink the sector and transform the difficulty into an opportunity. That's how I feel about it. And all of these are opportunities for educators to work more independently and learn to use tools and strategies that otherwise they might not have to before. So innovation, creativity, and resilience is required to make this work. Okay. So how do I uh, work with my classes? Well, as everyone else, we have both methods, the synchronous and the asynchronous. So I started with the synchronous and for example, the, the studio classes uh, are, are more boxed classes. They're more box driven classes because students already know the course of action and they know the end result. And, uh, you know, with studio classes, you have a set of milestones, you have your projects, and there's a lot of reviews, which we do this through the teams, everybody hops in, into the loop, and we talk about this all the time, and we show reviews, everybody sees the work, you know, what, what everyone's doing pretty much. But when it comes to the mobile interaction class, which I'm giving the semester, as I mentioned before, um, it's it's an, it's another beast on its own because the end result is the same, but the the projects differ so much that it's impossible for everyone to uh, follow the same kind of instruction. So I'm talking about 
students are doing like let's say pet uh, pet adoption apps recipe apps renting spaces app music learning apps museum apps booking apps you name it i mean it's, it's a huge range of uh, subjects so you, students have to go through learning the reachability of phones the repetition of phones the alignments the relation between objects inside a mobile phone the laws of proximities topography sizes colors color combination complementary colors the late, you know it goes on and on so it's quite a challenge there um, so the challenges that i see is how to motivate the students well let me give you some examples it's not the easiest thing because i've i don't know if you guys have experienced the same but i have students that they fall off the grid for like days weeks sometimes it's like what happened to you they either get stuck on TV, they get stuck on playing games, they're sleeping late, and the next day they cannot wake up, so they cannot participate in the class. So, how do you motivate these students? Then we have the problem that I see a lot is the research the students have to do. I cannot speak on anyone's behalf, but I can see uh, the students from probably our faculty, uh, their lack of research skills, maybe because with their cell phones and our digital age, everything has become a headline. Like you scroll through and you scroll through, you barely read anything anymore. So I, that's how they treat things. So when I ask them to do research, guess what? They come up blank many times. So I'm like, guys, you have to do your research. And I keep repeating this again and again and again. And of course, it's, it's, a, it's not easy. So I think we have to also reach out for that a lot. Now, let's not forget we have the, a lot of students feel isolated. Well, they feel isolated to begin with in many ways in a normal daily life. So, on, bring that with the current situation there's a lot of feelings of isolation and since there is no peer-to-peer -peer or one-to-one -one, um, physical conversation that adds up a lot to the issue right now we have so i feel that we have to as academics as academicians we should we must build relationships with our students um, if we, we we build relationships the students want this, they want internal motivation. And when they see someone that cares, then they will do their best to create, uh, finish their homework and just communicate with you. And I see that happening. I mean, it works, it really does. It's just, we have to put an extra effort to that. So, um, of course, let's not forget we have the internet connection, which, yes, in Istanbul, I don't think that we have issues <clears throat> overall, but I have students that they went to their own hometown. Forget that. It's quite a challenge to connect with them. Um, <clears throat> so um, having all of that, having said all that, let's talk about what I do. Well, I show up. I show up all the time. Uh, there is no day in the week that I don't show up. I show up even Sundays. And I find it the only way I can deal with this because there's need to be constant, the way I see it, evaluation. And the kids, the students crave for that. And it doesn't have to be like, you know, 20 minutes uh, review. When you keep this communication nonstop, the reviews are becoming, I mean, the, the time that you allocate per student is quite short, and which is a nice thing, of course. So I show up everywhere and it's, it's, I see it works very well. The other thing that I do a lot is I custom 
made record tutorials for the students. So for the mobile interaction class, I can see that there are problems when I do evaluations one-to-one. -one. I, I take the project, I can see on my computer what they send me the original project, and I'm like, I go through the, everything, their steps, and I can see immediately where do they need help. And that's what I, you know, I collect all these notes, and after the day is over, around, I would say my time, I go back to the microphone and I start creating custom video tutorials just for this class. So uh, that helps them tremendously. Another thing that I always do is, and I've been doing this for years, I do um, blended learning. Blended learning, I'm not sure if everybody knows that, it's the combination of in-class material with online material. So I combine this all the time. So what I do is I've created a lot of lectures on YouTube. I'm very active on YouTube. And um, I just send them there and I say, just do the tutorial and come back to me with all questions you have or whatever you might have. And we talk about that. So the tutorials are very targeted uh, per lecture. Uh, per example, etc. And again, that's something that works very well. Something else that I found very helpful is when you give them instructions, you give them very clear instructions with bulleting emails and uh, resources. I cannot stress this enough. How many resources I keep sending the student and share with them Take a look at this, take a look at this. And, but I don't rely on that always because they, guess what? They just don't do their own research in many times. So when I do peer to peer reviews, what I do is I say, here, look at this, here, look at this one. Because they're not familiar or maybe then they don't have the expertise how to search on their specific meta tags or keywords. So there is that learning experience as well that I adopt with them. And it works. In, in, in the ballpark, it works. Of course, when, when there are some students that are not keen in any of these things, well, I mean, there's nothing we can do about that. Um, the, the other thing that I found very uh, I would say surprisingly beneficial is the exams. So I give them progress exams and the exams only are time limited. They are time sensitive. So I would say probably 45 minutes and it's on the clock. You don't deliver, that's it. You get your grade. There's no, you know, hanky panky. There's no, oh, you know, teacher, I was a late. No, 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 no. You got your, you know, one minute or two minutes max and that's it. You send it, you deliver and we keep this you know, level up and it really, really works. I've seen this working very nicely. They respond to that. Um, the, the group spaces we have created through WhatsApp groups actually works very well. We take, in especially in the studio class, we take a bunch of all the students and we, we talk to them many, many times. And we share with them certain resources and we, we tell them certain things, messages, basically messages, communication, communication, communication. So for me, as a communicator, it's all about how can we make the students really feel comfortable in these new platforms. Um, so these are, for example, some of my lectures that I've been sharing with them online, like this great class that I have. App design prototype. This is a complete uh, way how to prototype uh, an application, and you can test it inside inside your phone, um, and that's great. So do that. Again, uh, part of the class of the uh, interaction design. This is the animation class. How to focus distance and learn how to create text animations, and it's just you target this. Elia spent 15 minutes. So oh, okay, I'm done. I'm done. Just okay. last slide. Sorry. It's just this one, which basically all this gives us 
a great excuse and opportunity to understand how to work remotely, making the most out of our digital tools, being productive, and you know what, become great communicators. And that's all I want to talk about. Thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was great. I, 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 I'll just uh, quick, quickly wrap up uh, everything. Fantastic presentation. We were doing like from practical use of practical tools to different kind of topics to kind of more theor theories behind these things. And then, uh, then we have a more uh, reflective presentation about online teaching by, by Elias and Malgo. So, so I, I open the floor for anyone who has questions. There are some detailed questions about uh, Alessandra, about work on Teams on, in your method. And there are other also technical questions. I don't know oh, if you want. This during the seminar, I took note of the questions, so maybe I could just ask the questions to each of the uh, lectures, and then maybe we can have other questions. If yeah, that's, that's okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, there was a question uh, for uh, Lamberto Amistadi from Barham Ali. Uh, are you are you here, Professor Lamberto, or? Okay. I have to okay. Open the yeah. okay, so the question was from Barham Ali. He was saying, what I heard from presenters are all about class management for e-learning, which is the course will be conducted between students and teachers. But here in Iraq, we need the third party to follow up the process and to ensure, for, uh, ensure from the process of education. Is there any platform to do such a thing? Well, we will use we we prepare we will prepare the course on the Moodle platform. So we are in the Moodle uh, in the Moodle in the Moodle environment. In the Moodle environment, you can uh, interact not too much with with the students because this uh, it is just uh, uh, an interaction in in co into composing the, for example, some uh, resources. You can do some resources together with the students, and but uh, I don't know the the platform is the Moodle platform. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the other question is for Professor Kamiz, and uh, it's from Luna. Uh, Alessandro's presentation is excellent. My question is: any tips or advice for managing students with working in teams? You're muted, Professor. Tips and advices for management, managing students in teams. So tip number one is that in teams, uh, they're pushing you to use notes. Um, one note, sorry, that's the name of the application. Don't do it. It's, it, it's, you know, it's confusing. It doesn't work very well. It's very clumsy interface. Tip number two is that in teams, in the meaning, you know, <clears throat> Uh, in the meeting space, you got a, a, something which is called the Microsoft Whiteboard, which is pretty good. But the version you get there is very much limited. So you can upload, you can download the same whiteboard from the Microsoft Store on, on Windows and also from the Apple Store for iOS. And it's much more, uh, you know, has m many more functions than the, than the one you get in inside there and i would say teams is pretty good you know for video uh, conferencing works pretty well that that part is okay it's quite stable um so that's it probably i mean if you just do it for video conferencing it's, it's good if you want to do more with it mm, it's okay but you know not 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 that much uh, can i have a question that kind of uh, intersects all of this uh I mean, uh, Georgia has talked about this a bit, and that's about technical requirements, and and also Elias about bandwidth. And but for example, when you have a big uh, uh, Lamberto, when you have a big uh, like uh, back home, I yeah. mean, can everyone we? I mean, would that come with your architecture education? So you get a big screen, or for example, so how do you think that we people should solve this across the across the universities and across the disciplines? Uh, so is it problematic? Uh, and so, so just a quick question uh, on, yeah, on the technical. 
okay. because because it, it is too much too big too much big yeah but yeah but uh, uh, the the 32 inch wacom is just in the in the room of the labor of the workshop is not uh, is not uh, portable yeah but uh, there are other models of the wacom very 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 small 13 inch yeah you can uh, you you can have different uh, size of these uh, electronic tables but the the wacom is very very nice because uh, the pen of the of the wacom can uh, have maintain the sensibility of the hand of the hand and the inclination of the pen this is very well for design yeah thank you so maybe we could switch to the next question. This is for Professor uh, Kamiz as well, from Zuhal Ulusoy. Uh, she says, this presentation is really amazing. Can we have another look of the list of platforms, programs used in combination? Actually have the presentation for a closer look study, she says. Professor Kamiz? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, so we have published already those, you know, tests we did on the different tools. So I'm going to link in the in the chat in a few seconds the the you know the the, the website we have established on teaching online with some of those tests and more to come. And okay. so there was one one other part of it. It's. Uh, she in combination and uh, have the presentation for a closer look. But yes, and then we're going to share the video on the on the drum laboratory website. So that is also something you have in the invitation as well, uh, the, the link of our laboratory. So and that is going to be shared there, the video. And uh, eventually, if we can share the PDF of the presentations, I would have to ask all the lecturers to send us the PDF of their presentation. So maybe a low resolution presentation because we cannot, you know, we I'll put hundreds of megabytes over there. But yes, so we're going to be sharing the video. We're going to be sharing the, all the other information. And I'm going to link here the, the, um, the published list of those tools. Yes. From T. Ling C. Uh, asking, how good is the pen control speed and accuracy to you, Professor Kamis? Um, so I think it's pretty good. You know, it's uh, not as good as the real pencil, but it is pretty good. You know, I, I mean, it's it's even a different art. How can I say? It's a different tool of artistic expression. So it has its own, you know, modes of. So once you get used to it, you can do certain things that you cannot do with a normal pencil. I would say. So it's just, you know, it's a slow pencil. Let's call it like this, <laughs> but not very slow. Okay, thank you. The next question is for Frederick Beal. Uh, Professor Beal, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so this one's from Luna. She's actually repeating the question she asked to Professor Kamis. She says, I reiterate my question to Alessandra about managing students working in teams. So the question was, any tips, advice for managing students working in teams? Well, I was actually showing a course that uh, when given in Rome was uh, an on-site course and, uh, and would have involved walking excursions through the city, stopping, commenting, recording, documenting while doing that. In the moving of the course online, we changed the format slightly, which in, into uh, what we call at Pratt a lecture lab course. And a lecture lab course is generally where you gather together a larger group of students, and then there is a lecture. And then it breaks out into the uh, different uh, smaller sections for the lab. And so the way that we revised this was to uh, I was able to put together the quote lecture and the lecture, the lectures were the walks and you saw an example of that. And the individual faculty in their labs, what they did was they focused on assigning different episodes along the walk to various students. 
And then they gathered together as a group. And then the different students shared with each other the particular episode that they had researched. And so that by the end of that class, there was a much more comprehensive understanding of that excursion that came both from the original presentation, but then also these kind of sort of incremental moments along that route that formed the synthesis of understanding. And it allowed all of the different students to really share their particular perspective that came about through that uh, engagement. And I, and I think that was pretty effective. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, can okay. I have uh, here uh, an extra? While you read the questions, I can have a smart question. Actually, the forever. questions are over. We can okay, open great. Them. Then I'm going to ask, and this kind of very much uh, relates to Luca, but also to everyone and, and, and to Fred's uh, kind of Google Earth. And that is the question of digital twins. Uh, because what we are seeking now is to kind of uh, go into the digital twins of, of our cities, which can be Google Earth, can be kind of an ideal representation of a building, a digital building where you can measure and work with it. And, uh, and the question of professional software, GIS, Beam, that could kind of help. So anyone wants to comment on this about how the, the things, now we can find out some problems that, you know, the, the digital reality, we can see how much it corresponds to the physical reality. So anyone has uh, comments on this and how can we maybe create better digital or they're sufficient or this kind of uh, uh, how they fit the practice, for example, architecture. For example, we had Georgia spoke of the salt who kind of design uh, uh, airplanes and where they don't do architecture. Whereas, so anyone, Luca maybe, you can start with architecture and how this, uh, how the, the digital, the digitalization, what is the, what are the needs that this uh, kind of uh, mm -hmm. yes, online teaching the, needs? Thank you for the question, Todor. Um, well, actually we are improving a lot our uh, teaching uh, by uh, digitization uh, techniques. Um, I have to say that uh, uh, probably for our area of uh, uh, teaching and research, so survey of architecture, uh, the improvement uh, uh, recently were uh, uh, very big, were huge. Um, we have to think that uh, we are dealing with this technology at the first year and then the second year uh, in another uh, course of uh, advanced uh, survey. Uh, we really um, use uh, um, digital tools, uh, for example, photogrammetry tools uh, um, for making the students uh, um, more familiar with uh, 3D technologies and 3D representation. Um, the problem for us is that uh, very few tools are precise enough for architectural documentation. Uh, I see that for urban studies, uh, many tools are um, affordable enough and uh, also um, precise enough uh, for us that even two, three, four, five millimeters can make the difference between a good survey and bad survey. Uh, some tools are not uh, um, enough uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, precision. Um, but yes, I, I, I agree that the future is uh, dealing with the uh, digitization of uh, cultural heritage, also to uh, preserve the memory of uh, our um, heritage. We are losing heritage day after day, day by day, uh, for a fire, for an earthquake. We have a terrible earthquake in Ferrara uh, six uh, years ago and we have lost a lot of, uh, of heritage. So yes, digitization could be the, uh, the right way to go ahead. I, I wanna like to contribute a little bit to that question if I understood your question correctly, because I wrote something quite a number of years ago, uh, which again was based on the program that we run in Rome and it was called uh, Architecture and It's Double. And the double was the representation of architecture. So, uh, you know, students, the education of an architect is about 
teaching students to represent what ultimately is reality. And that there, there has always been a difficulty. You know, there's a trajectory through any education that begins abstractly and it begins to sort of accumulate certain knowledge. But along the route, along the way, there are moments when students recognize things in real life that they have been trying to represent through their drawings. Whatever the, whatever the vehicle of drawing is. I mean, when I wrote this, we weren't even using computers. So this goes way back. But the, but the thinking is exactly the same. There's this, there's this operation that's parallel to reality that's trying to represent reality. And, what, and the education is complete when somehow those two things come together. When a student can make a line and understand precisely what that line is in the real world. So what we're doing right now, there's a, there's a great irony to that. <laughs> because we're effectively removing the kind of critical or we're stepping away from the kind of the critical aspect of that which is the reality or we're trying to redefine reality like like the notion of sort of sort of uh, reconstituting the study of the urban environment into one's living room or bedroom uh, as a way to to continue with the processes that have been used before and so there's a there that's another kind of removal i think right so I, it ends up being a big question for me um, as, to, as, to, as to what this really means, uh, both for the future, but going forward, right? Um, you know, how we remain within this kind of virtual simulated world as opposed to sort of the rapid return to what we once had before. That, that's a very good, uh, yes, very, very good, uh, uh, Alessandro. Sorry. Father, uh, just a few words. I would like to uh, ask Professor Balzani if, if he is back here again and he would like to say something. And then welcome Pierre Gauthier, University of Concordia, Quebec, and Roberta Spallone, Polytechnic of Torino. And also if they would like to say something. Yeah. Uh, I'm Pierre Gauthier, so uh, thank you, Alessandro. Um, I missed the beginning of the presentation. I had two Zoom uh, meetings. Um, I wonder, you know, I mean, this is what I got, you know, was very interesting. Maybe it was addressed before, but I was wondering how um, we could mobilize the tools, you know, for urban morphology to inform, you know, like the, the teaching, the analysis and so on. Because of course, you know, what is missed right now is the ability to go with students and visit, you know, the, the environment, the real environment, which is absolutely essential. But, you know, historically there's, there's been a tension, so to speak, in architecture where it's about, you know, like the experience, the, you know, like overvaluing maybe, perhaps, you know, like the experimental you know ex uh, exercise you know being in space but urban morphology you know like develop analytical tools that allows us to unveil you know like relationships spatial relationships that are not necessarily visible often they're not visible you know like to the eye uh, so this exercise, you know, I wonder if any of you have, you know, experience or doubts, you know, like in their teaching about how we can mobilize those uh, analytical tools, if you wish, and in conjunction with the, um, uh, you know, geospatial technologies and the visualization uh, tools such as Google Earth and so on. Uh, so that you can, because that's another way to experience the space, so to speak, you know, like it's more abstract, but it's equally relevant, you know, and sometimes it, it gives access to a, an aspect of reality that is not readily accessible just by visiting the place and trying to absorb, you know, what's there. I don't know if I was clear, but... Uh, so there are the technical aspects, but there are also the analytical tools and that are available to us in particular as morphologists. Roberta, are you there? Marcello, are you there? No, they're not there. What about Murat, are you there? <laughs> Uh, 
microphone, the microphone. You have to unmute yourself, Argo. Okay, thanks to this uh, meeting, uh, we are linked to the real life and lovely people. Thanks a lot, really. I enjoyed very much. You know, I'm, I'm looking for the next one. Uh, you know, the, the next uh, part of the series. Let's make it. Okay, thank you very much. Chris, you know, it's, you wanna... it is, it is uh, one more thing. Architecture, as Frank's, Francis uh, Ching states, is a tactile experience. We saw many, I mean, uh, we saw some students are trying, experiencing the, 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 the chilly water uh, uh, during the summertime. And then, you know, uh, there are many things. How can we manage in the, in the, in the future and then combine or hybridize, maybe this is going to give us a chance to think of uh, the, or <clears throat> advance our techniques uh, to think on design and then representation, I guess. You know, it, it, it is worth it to think of it. Uh, we could, I mean, I, I can talk on my behalf. Uh, I wouldn't have bothered to learn uh, so many things I learned this period. You know, uh, I don't know. It's a period of learning and uh, making progress. And then, you know, I learned a lot. And then um, I'm hoping to uh, this period is go going to contribute to, to, to develop our tools and uh, techniques, I guess. Thanks a lot for the all co contributions. Okay, thank you. Well, so, well, I, I should I should wrap it and stop recording probably because yes, that and, is your... and, and you know one one of the thing is that I think this lasts too long. I should I think you should keep to a two hour format maximum because I mean three and a half hour. You know my daughter here she is getting uh, so I'll stop recording now so then we can go for informal. Uh, okay. There was another question on the chat box. Another right? question. Okay. Yeah, just one last one. So very uh, last one. Okay. Okay. Jacob Fransuk uh, said, uh, "Thank you all for presentations. They were very valuable. Maybe I missed something, but I would like to ask an open question to everyone. How do you deal with the final project exhibitions?" Uh, I, I answered on the chat. Thank you. We have a, an exhibition committee of students that are working on this. I mean, this is my studio. So in my studio, I asked my students, you want to form a committee and, you know, deal with the issue of the final exhibition of your projects? And some of them joined. We got six of them. And so we have group there and they're working. And, uh, you know, so we will see. We're going to be doing a virtual exhibition in the first space and maybe inshallah later we would, we're going to go in Galata in Cale and have the exhibition as it was planned before. Uh, Roberta are you there can you say something you have to unmute yourself we cannot hear you there you go very very nice very interesting um, uh, very wide uh, interest of uh, um, the speakers, so uh, I learned so much uh, to this conference. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Todor, now you can wrap it up and close. Don't leave it open. Just I, 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 I'll just uh, stop recording. So, so I'm going to upload. Uh, I, I'm going to send to Alessandro after this, and you can uh, download this thing. So I'm stopping. Cut from here.